Hello, welcome everybody to this episode of Unlimited, where we talk to leaders uh, across the world that are doing incredible things. And today is a special treat. We have Stephen Bassett from the Paradigm Research Group. He has been um, fighting the fight uh, so intelligently over many, many, many years to get some of the information about UFOs and ETs uh, disclosed and available to the American public. So we really honor his work. We also have Alan he, Alan Steinfeld, um, my partner in crime here in Lightnet. <laughs> um, he's such a fun um, person to be with. And he's going to be um, showing a little video before we get started to contact in the desert because Steve is going to be there. And so are we. Lightnet's going to have a booth there. And um, as you were just saying, Alan, this is the first time in three years <laughs> that we're all getting together. Yeah, the whole time. I mean, this is a community that's gelling at this really critical moment in history. So let me play the little promo and then we'll uh, and then I have something else I want to share with Steve and then we'll just jump into the dialogue. So you see this on your screen, right? Here we go. This is a little. The ninth annual Contact in the Desert Conference happens the weekend of June 2nd at the beautiful Renaissance Resort near Palm Springs, California. Join me, George Norrie, to discover what's next from speakers such as Graham Hancock, Richard Dolan, Nick Pope, Stephen Bassett, and over 50 other top researchers. Come make contact with new friends and discover the latest fascinating information from the fields of UFO studies, artificial intelligence, psychic phenomenon, and more. Reserve your seat now at contactinthedesert.com. All right, that's a little contact in the desert. Um, and Steve will be there along with us and probably maybe three to 4,000 people who are at the cutting edge at really, I think, one of the momentous times in human history. And this is something I always like to introduce Steve Bassett as saying the one of the hardest working people in ufology. He's been at it really nonstop for 20, 30, 30 years, at least I think I've known him. And Put on such important events at the citizens hearings for UFO disclosure and um, so much else. But I want to ask you, Steve, because this is the latest breaking news in our team. Um, one to, somebody took it for the team here. This is the, the this is the revelation that everyone, I'm sure, in Washington around the world is talking about. Gary Nolan at the Salt Talks in New York City just last week, May 18th, 2023. He was asked by this interviewer, here we go. I'm just gonna show a few minutes of this. I'm curious, do you believe that extraterrestrial intelligence has visited planet Earth? I think you can go a step further. It hasn't just visited, it's been here a long time and it's still here. Uh, and it has uh, uh, basically, um, you know, people talk about the wow signal, uh, looking for extraterrestrial intelligence. The wow signal is that people see it on an almost regular basis. That's the communication that's already here. I just want to follow up with it saying, listen to the next question, because the interviewer doesn't quite get what Gary is saying. And, and that statement seems so incredible that it, it's tough to believe, right? Like people hear that, and maybe a lot of people here hear that, and they don't believe it. And so I'm curious, if you had to assign a probability to that statement, that you believe extraterrestrial intelligence has visited, visited this planet, what probability would you assign? A hundred percent. And that's not just my opinion. I mean, look, um, the National Defense Appropriation Act passed last year, signed by, by Biden in uh, December. 30 pages of that is the establishment of an unidentified aerial phenomenon office the establishment of looking into the harm that's happened to any of a number of the individuals, going back to 1945 and looking at the disinformation and misinformation that has been uh, basically articulated over the decades. Twelve U.S. senators have signed on to a document that basically says we want the information. The establishment of an office, Arrow, in the Department of Defense, has 25 people working in it right now. And what's their, what's their goal? Collecting the information across all of the, uh, all of the U.S. Department of Intelligence, sorry, Department of Defense, intelligence offices, and collation of that 
into a uniform format for the very first time and provision of that then to Congress, the creation of a whistleblowers program specifically that allows people from, the, from within, who I'm going to say this, who've been working on the reverse engineering programs, reverse engineering of objects, so that they can come in and break their oaths, but specifically just to talk to Congress and give that information in classified settings. And that the most recent one that happened was just last weekend, and it created quite a hornet's nest in Washington. Okay, Steve Bassett, if that's not disclosure, what is, what's going on there and how does this change the whole field we're in? Disclosure can only come from the President of the United States, period. Mm -hmm. All right, so it's not disclosure. It's not. But what about but, what he said? That's right. He's, a, he's, he's part of, the, he's working with the government. I mean, right? Yes and no. Let, let, me, let me see if I can provide the context for people to get what's happening here. First of all, uh, back in 2008, at the end, after the X conference of that year, fifth one, held a press conference at the National Press Club. Did that every time. And in that particular one, Dr. Edgar Mitchell came up to the podium and told CNN and the rest of the journalists there, there's an extraterrestrial presence here. Uh, in May of 2016, Robert Bigelow, one time a billionaire, uh, involved with government research and with contracts, substantial contracts with NASA, went on 60 Minutes and said, there's an extraterrestrial presence here. And then a number of years go by, a lot happens. And a congressman from Tennessee, Tim Burchette, goes on Fox News and News Nation and Newsmax and just about any, any other place he can get and says, there's an extraterrestrial presence here. And now Gary Nolan has said it. So you kind of see kind of a trend, but also what's going on? There's a couple of things going on, but most importantly, here is what many people who I'm sure the vast majority of people that saw that interview, it's spreading around the internet, don't know or forgotten or don't know. 2017, the organization to the Stars Academy of Arts and Sciences announced itself, put up a website, and then put a web uh, a interview up on Facebook where Mr. Elizondo, Mr. Mellon spoke. Gary Nolan was not there. And thus was launched this what we'll call initiative. It was an organization with a mission statement. It was at a lot of uh, moving parts, uh, but it had 10 people attached to it who were all former members of the military intelligence world, DOD, CIA, and so forth, Lockheed Martin, 10 people, essentially civilians, no longer on a government payroll. This was no accident. It wasn't a hobby. They had a very specific reason why they chose to do this. And that began the, the what I will call the end game with respect to the truth embargo. Now, everyone was interested in what they were going to do next. It was impressive, just their resumes. And what they did next was spectacular. Two of the individuals of that 10, Mellon and Elizondo, were key in, in providing to Leslie Kane and to Ralph Blumenthal three gun camera clips, the Pentagon admitted it gave them. And they gave them to the New York Times, along with a very substantial news story regarding a program that had been run for a number of years at the Pentagon with names and so forth. That triggered two news stories written by Leslie Kane, Ralph Blumenthal, Helen Cooper, one on the 16th of December, the next day, the second one in the print, but they everything went up on the web, including those three gun camera clips. That was the real ultimate turning point. And from then on, we have been heading toward disclosure at a relatively rapid pace. 
So again, let's add more context. What happens after that New York Times article, which basically just shifts everything? It's like a seismic shift. Seven of the individuals stayed back. They would say things from time to time, like Hal Putoff, Chief Justice. Um, but three individuals went forward. They were the point of the spear. They had a, a, a agenda. They knew what they were going to do. And what they were going to do was do what was necessary to facilitate the government to finally do what it had to do to end the truth embargo. And over the five years, that's exactly what they've done. And it has been very, very hard. Why? Because one, it wasn't supposed to take this long. They had originally planned, I'm almost certain, to launch in 2016 after the conclusion of the 2016 election into a Clinton administration that had connections to the ET issue going all the way back to 1993, had spoken about it all through the campaign. And the campaign chairman of that candidate had been addressing the issue in the years in between 1996 and her campaign. They were literally wired into it. And, and, and this, in this uh, community, including myself, have gone to uh, lengths to ensure that that connection was always out there in the media. Hundreds of articles have been written about it. And so they were looking at a situation where she's elected, they announced the To The Stars Academy, do the same thing they did, right? And those two things together would have gone into the White House January 20 of 2017. And we would probably already be three years or more into, maybe four years, five years, into the post-disclosure world. But that's not what happened. The election went a different way and put them in a very awkward position because they were semi-outed. So they had put a lot on the line, but now it was more problematic. They went ahead and launched anyway, to their great credit. But because of the political circumstances in the United States, which are unprecedented, chaotic, bizarre, because of a pandemic that turned up, the worst in the modern era, still going on, because a new war goes, uh, gets underway in Europe, not just any war, but a war involving a nuclear power that's deliberately saber rattling nuclear weapons as part of its desperate effort to try to grab more territory. I mean, these are unprecedented things. And in spite of all that, the disclosure process, which they are assisting to, to move forward, has continued on methodically going forward. Now, the three people I'm referring to were Luis Elizondo, his area, military intelligence, speaking about the issue kind of from that context. Christopher Mellon, because of his background, his area, politics. And Gary Nolan's area, science. Elizondo gets a huge amount of attention, does a lot of, uh, of media, gets the word out, a lot of excitement, things going on. Mellon is working behind the scenes, taking people up on the hill to brief members of Congress to get them prepared for what's coming. Lots of briefings, lots of members. And Gary was kind of sitting back, but he would turn up from time to time. And now he just made his move. And so in the full context here, you're seeing how these three men have been the key players in this final act of ending the truth embargo. Now, let's get more specific. Gary goes on, he does this interview. The thing he had to do, the thing that was most important was say there's an extraterrestrial presence here. And then he's asked questions and he goes on and he puts some other context in. But one thing I have to remind everybody about is that this process is underway, and it, which includes these three gentlemen and a lot of other people, is a process designed to get us to disclosure. That is what it's about. It's not about how they're going to tell us about the extraterrestrial present and what it's here and why it's here and to start revealing stuff to us. No, no, they can't do that. It's about facilitating this process. And this process has to, has to be conducted in such a way that it works. 
In other words, the Congress participates in it. The DOD participates in it. We get to hearings and nobody gets too far out ahead of their skis because when you do that, you fall face down and slide down the mountain. It is not about the United States government finally deciding to look at this issue and do all that stuff you're supposed to do and find out what it is. No, it is not about that at all. The United States government has known about this phenomena, has had crash vehicles and technology and projects and USAPs going on for 76 solid years. It has spent billions upon billions of dollars addressing the reality of a UAP, non-human intelligence, engaging us. And so it already knows. So now it's how do we tell the people now? How do we get to where we can share this with the people with a minimum amount of disruption, destruction, unpleasantness? How can we give the people a sense that we are we're trying to do the right thing so they won't be too hard on us when we have to answer the really tough questions after disclosure takes place? And because the process is about getting to disclosure, there are all there are a lot of limitations on how far you can go, what you can say. There's a lot of confusion. There's language issues. I've said years ago, when this finally day finally arrives, it's going to be messy and complicated and chaotic. And whatever people are trying to do, they're going to do their best. But the idea that it's going to be a crisp, very perfectly well-run thing. No, 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 no. Not, not in the world that we live in with Twitter influencers, with 10 million people following them, and media all over the place, and thousands, actually millions of podcasts and whatever, everybody in a position to make a statement, jump in, throw in, make a hoax, do whatever. Sure, it's going to be wild and crazy, but overall, it's relatively solid. And so when Gary Nolan goes on that show, there are things he can say and things he can't say. And he's trying to maneuver so that he doesn't, again, get ahead of his skis. Same thing with Elizondo, same thing with Mellon. There are a few people who are not part of this, but are trying to step into it because they see what's happening and they see how important it is. And the best example of that is Tim Burchette. Tim Burchette is not one of the people that were getting briefed by Mellon. He's not on a committee that's key to the process going forward to hold hearings, but he knows there's a lot of scuttlebutt going around on the Hill, you can be sure, chit chat in the cafeteria and so forth. And he, he, he got the word, oh, wow, this is happening. And he decided, hey, I'm a member of Congress. I'm going to be involved too. And so he comes forward and he says whatever the hell he wants to. And that's okay too, all right? But Gary Nolan's not Tim Burchett. So Gary said a number of things which are a little bit problematic. Doesn't matter. He talks about the fact they're non-living entities. He says they've been they're here and they've been here, which is fine. A lot of people interpreted that as he's saying they, they were walking amongst us. No, he wasn't saying that. Right. And so, but that's the key thing is he said there's an extraterrestrial presence. Now, what is the strategic reason why Nolan would do this? Because everyone else is pretty much trying to stay away from that. We know that they go right up to the edge, but they don't go all the way. The reason is probably this. Every time somebody of high substance, high achievement, high rank, high station makes a statement like that, whether it's uh, uh, Mitchell or, or even a Burchette uh, or, or a Bigelow, and you can expect some others soon to be doing it, there is a very strategic reason for it, and that is to lock the back door on the process. The United States government and all of its functions is now facing a worldwide growing intensive engagement of what they're doing with huge expectations, very little patience, and a huge amount of capability, media capability to look, investigate, share, spread it around. It is formidable. And not everybody in the government is necessarily on board with this, uh, whether or not they have any influence on the process, but there is, I'm sure, some ambivalence, maybe some buyer's remorse. And so at any time, some may come together and say, 
you know, look, this is just, this is hard. This is, you know, and oh man, and, and the press is driving us crazy. Let's, let's just slip out the back door. They won't see us leave. And then there'll just be an empty room. And finally people are going, what, 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 what happened? Well, uh-uh, because the back door is locked. There's no back door. They're not going anywhere. They're going to have to see this through because people like Nolan have told the world. And when you go out and do a talk show, just a talk show in New York, which is nobody even knew it existed, never heard of it before. It goes to YouTube and it goes worldwide and they know it. You don't have to go in 60 minutes. You don't have to do it at the White House. Just do it on a talk show in New York. And his statement is going worldwide within days. Right. The back door is locked. There is no going back. So that is the strategic basis by what he's doing. But there's there's another thing. When Tim Burchette does what he's doing, whether he knows it or not, he's making it easier for other members of Congress to step forward and say the same thing because nothing happened to Tim. Tim is doing just fine. He, in fact, he's getting more press than he's ever gotten as a member of Congress. He's not, and he's getting praise for his boldness in speaking frankly to the UAP issue. And guess what? He's also now getting gigs and being asked to come on CNN and give interviews about other subjects. So he's doing fine. And so a lot of other members of Congress are going, well, clearly, if I want to speak to this, play, play a role in history, I'm going to be OK. So well, guess so, what? Yeah. I mean, I'm almost done. Gary okay. Nolan is a Nobel Prize nominee. He has he's Stanford tenure. He's in that community, the same community that tried to railroad uh, John Mack, that's been sitting silent on this issue for 75 years, willing not to go there. Can't touch it. Can't deal with it. Can't teach it. Can't do anything. Don't want to lose our funding. Don't want to. Don't want to embarrass ourselves. Completely stayed out of it. One of the greatest intellectual failures in the history of the human race. 5,000 colleges, millions of professors, see no, hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil. And here's Gary. When Gary says that, guess what? Nothing's happened to Gary. Gary's getting praised around the world. He's people's hero. It's fantastic. And so he sent a message to every academic out there, whether they're in astrophysics, genetics, or just a philosophy professor, he's saying, it's okay. If you want to come forward and say, yeah, I've got three PhDs. I've been following this issue. I've read everything Richard Dolan ever wrote. And I can tell you, yeah, there's extraterrestrials here. You see how that starts to develop? They're green. And, and, and Elizondo was green lighting a lot of people in the military intelligence. The pilots are green lighting other pilots. In other words, more and more people are starting to realize that they can speak to this. There cannot be going back. And the last thing I would like to say, and I'm not criticizing Gary on this. He's in an interview. He's speaking. He's trying to do what he's doing, is that he used the term whistleblower. And that is not the correct term. These are not whistleblowers. When they go and when they speak to Congress or they speak to air or anything else, they're not breaking any oaths. They will be given the permission to do that. They're not going to have to run in and go, oh, I got something for you. I, this is going to break six oaths. They're going to be walking in and say, look, we want to talk to you about this. You are cleared to say this. Right. And in many cases, that'll be automatic because they'll be interviewing in a classified setting to people who have clearances. When they go before Congress in the hearings that are coming, they will not have to lie. They won't have to break any oaths. Absolutely not. They will be asked questions and those that they can answer, they will answer. And those answers will be profound. And if right. they have something that is, is tied down by an NDA or any other kind of national security limit, all they have to say to the sitting member of Congress is, sir or madam, I cannot speak to that in an open setting, but I'm happy to speak in a classified setting where it will be clear that the people they're talking to have the clearance to hear it. So this business of whistleblowers is a mistake. Why? Because if you know anything about whistleblowers and what they do, they come forward to spill the beans on awful stuff happening in their, their, their place of employment, 
uh, illegal stuff, cr fraud, crime, sexual abuse, and on and on. There have been whistleblowers in major companies and corporations like the cigarette business and so forth. And they go through hell. They go through hell, and, and, and as a result of that, they try to help them a little bit by passing a whistleblower act in the civilian world and also in the government world. Those acts have already existed before Arrow ever turned up. And even the ones that come forward with those acts have a really difficult time. And some of the whistleblowers are extremely controversial. Edward Snowden was a whistleblower, without question. He now lives in Russia. There are people that think he is a great hero. And there are people that think he's a traitor. And so whistleblowers will get threats on their lives. So why in the hell do we want to be calling the witnesses that are going to testify about nuclear weapons tampering or anything else whistleblowers implying that they're just another Edward Snowden and those people that feel they have no business talking to the Congress about this are going to send them death threats on Facebook. So please, they are not whistleblowers. I, I get good. that. No, no, okay. Steve, I just I'm done. one, one follow-up with that is some of the other things Gary Nolan mentioned, the 12 senators... I, I'm sure it's Chile and Rubio, but he also mentioned the hornet's nest that just did this huge explosion after some kind of briefing. At the end of that, he says there's just been a huge hornet's nest that's gone off in, um, in Washington. You remember that? And do you know what he was referring to? And, and talk about the senators that's on our side, too. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, I, I'm glad you mentioned that. You see, Rubio and Gillibrand sent a letter to the DOD. And he announced that letter on his on his website, his 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 Senate website, uh, with a press release and a letter, essentially saying, "Look, guys, we need to speed things up. We, you, we expected a little more, a little more funding, a little sooner, and so forth and so forth." And and that's fine. Again, that's what they've been doing. It's just another example that they're absolutely committed to getting seeing this through. But it was notable that in that letter, in that in the in the press release, it indicated the other senators that are signing on to that letter. I think it's like 13 of them. So now you have 13 other senators who are now on the record. That doesn't mean they're given an interview. It doesn't mean they've talked to the media. But you see, in other words, you're seeing more and more members of Congress getting on board this train. Pretty soon it's going to be very full of members of Congress because they are not stupid people. So occasionally, it's hard to get that, but they're not stupid people. They know that the history that's unfolding is unprecedented. And of course, they want to be involved in it. Of course, they want to be there. This is, you, you, you'll never get another opportunity in their lifetime to be a part of something this important. And so, yes, they're going to sign on, but they're going to do it in the appropriate ways. And, and if they're smart, nobody's going to run out there. And I'm not casting shade at Burchette. I'm talking about people like on the Intel Committee, people that are key to the key process, running out there and trying to get extra limelight. No, they're not going to do that. As far as uh, hornessness, look, what he's basically referring to is as everything has gone forward, but everything we, we see in the media, I mean, I, I've, I've got 5,000 articles now that I've logged into my print media archive about this has been coming, streaming out of the press for five years, 5,000 articles being covered intensely, right? So we know that, and we know what's happening in the public arena, UFO Twitter, and all the interest. But what we don't know or have much insight to is how much activity is still is going on behind the scenes, and there always is. And so undoubtedly, when something happens, like that letter from uh, Gillibrand and Rubio, uh, I'm sure that that stirred a lot of people. Uh, you've got you've got 435 members of, of the of the House, 100 members of the Senate, and they all have staff. You're talking thousands and thousands of people up on the Hill, having lunch together, working every day, talking to each other. And I assure you, there's all kinds of things that that stir the pot up there that that don't get covered by the media. So I, he's referring essentially to that. He's letting us know that behind the scenes, there's still plenty going on because the, the entire Congress is, is going to have to adjust and get ready for these hearings and all that it will mean for the United States and them 
And that's also true of everyone in every other agency, though they're not going to have that much public exposure. Everyone in the CIA is in the process of adjusting to this. The FBI, the Air Force, the Navy, every entity in this government that has anything to do with national security is in the process of adjusting to what is coming behind the scenes in their own way. And historians uh, hopefully will have the job going forward the rest of this century and writing countless books uh, based upon hopefully information will be available and stuff won't be thrown out the back door or, or put in a shredder where they can actually write about how this all went down inside, right? The history of the truth embargo right up until disclosure and of course beyond. I hope I'm around to read some of those books. So that's a, a sense of what he's talking about. It's a sense of what's going on there. Uh, and I invite people to, you know, try to take a larger perspective on this to try so that you can get what's happening and not miss the boat. Yeah, this is really is a, an exciting time because like you said, the back door is closed and where we're really going is that the president has some, this is your theory and I agree with you, is that some head, head of state needs to announce this. It can't come from anybody else for there to be really disclosure. Um, I want to invite everybody who's watching live to join the um, the the Zoom room so you can ask questions to Steve. You can do that by going to unlimited.org uh, slash unlimited. Um, there you can get into the Zoom room. Alan, you were Zinka, just- Zinka, Zinka, I just wanted to talk about one person who's trying to pry the back door open. And I think you know who I'm talking about. Let me just do a little- clip of this one month before the Nolan revelation, we get this guy. I should also state clearly for the record that in our research, Arrow has found no credible evidence thus far of extraterrestrial activity, off-world technology, or objects that defy the known laws of physics. In the event sufficient scientific data were ever attained that a UAP encountered can only be explained by extraterrestrial origin, we are committed to working with our interagency partners at NASA to appropriately inform U.S. government's leadership of its findings. For those few cases that have leaked to the public previously and subsequently commented on by the U.S. government, I encourage those who hold alternative theories or views to submit your research to credible peer-reviewed scientific journals. Now, Steve, what is he doing? What is this guy up to? It's so sleazy. Well, I, 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 would, I would suggest a different tone. Not this guy. Right, right. This is the head of our arrow. He's a scientist. He's got a tremendous career. And he was the one that ended up getting this job. And let me tell you, this is not an easy job. He is sitting as the head of the entity which is being set up so the government can show good faith that it finally is dealing with this issue in an appropriate way, even though it knows the ET presence has been around for a long time, even though it knows that ETs certainly have, have escalated their activity since 47, and yet he has to still stay and do what needs to be done. He's under, as the, as the head of that organization, he's under relentless pre 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 pressure. Sean, tell us the truth. What have we got? Uh, where are the files? You know, we want it now. We want it now, 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 now. Not an easy gig. And at the same time, he's got people like Gary Nolan and others that are shutting the back door on him, which is okay. But it's kind of, you see the cognizant dissonance? Yeah. Gary Nolan is a Nobel Prize nominee with a, a, a very fine record. He's a brilliant man. He says ETs are here. So why isn't Sean Kirkpatrick saying ETs are here? Because he can't. He is not the president of the United States. He wasn't given that job to do disclosure. Only the president can confirm the ET presence and declassify as needed and assist in declassifying the information that will start to bring it to the American people, not the Secretary of Agriculture, not the assistant deputy secretary, the assistant deputy secretary of whatever the hell, only the president, not him. And so he, 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 he gives an interview and basically 
This was a way in, to sort of dampen a little bit to keep people from putting, coming constantly, pressuring Arrow and himself. And what he basically said is Arrow, Arrow does not at this time have confirming evidence of, the, of an extraterrestrial presence. That doesn't mean that the government doesn't have it. He didn't say the United States government in all of its agencies, research facilities, and classified programs has no evidence whatsoever of an extraterrestrial presence. He just said Arrow doesn't. And Arrow has only been around for about 10 months. Now, this is mendacious. I get it. I understand that. And I've talked about this now in hundreds of podcasts over the last couple of years. I'm asking people to be generous and graceful and understanding. The United States government is not perfect. It has done awful things and it's done some good things. The decision to embargo the ET reality that they absolutely knew, if not sooner, at Roswell in July for 76 years was a national security decision. Made then, not now, right? Don't get into the presentism stuff by judging everything from 76 years ago about what we know now. They had to do it based upon the situation. And they kept it as a national security matter for a long time, which in some cases is not that big a deal. If you're working on some special weapon and it's got an underground facility and you're doing all the research and nobody knows about it, you can keep it secret indefinitely until one day you bring it out and oh, there it is. The, what they faced in 1947 forward is that we have to quote keep secret, really embargo, something that people are seeing all the time. It's going on around the world because it's not some something under their complete control in an underground facility. It's ETs and they can go where they want, when they want, how they want. And there's not a damn thing the government could do about it. And so how do you do that? Well, you've got to engage in a very sophisticated, complex misinformation, propaganda, disinformation, distraction campaign. And one of the reasons you have to do that is that we are a constitutional republic with non-authoritarian rule. And you simply can't round people up and kill them or make them disappear until you scare the hell out of everybody so nobody's going to say anything. That's not the way we operate. They had to do it in a country that had a First Amendment, a right to speak, and so forth. It was very difficult. And they had to lie and lie and lie and lie and lie. They have been lying every day of every week and every month since 47. And now you come to the situation where that policy has to end. You see the problem? you've been lying for 76 years and now you're going to tell the truth and you just somebody's just going to run forward the president going to say the president the, all of this could have been avoided at any time there were a number of presidents they could have simply held an, a, a conference in the uh, i mean a press conference gone in the east room and said look there's extraterrestrials here we should have told you we didn't screw you how do you think that would have gone well how 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 chaotic and destructive would that have been it would have been a mess it would have been awful and so now they're trying to do it the right way. But the right way means that they have to lie their way out of an even bigger lie to good purpose. All right. And there's nothing unusual about this. And in, in diplomacy, global diplomacy, we constantly have to go through this rigmarole and things like that as you work with other nations. Because if you just go in there and tell them exactly what you think, they walk out of the room. And the next thing you know, you're having a war. So diplomacy, all of this and protocols. This is what you have to do when dealing with huge issues in complex ways. And so essentially, they're having to do this process. They can't really say what they really know. They have to avoid questions if they can. They have to say things like, well, I, I can't really talk about that. And sometimes they just have to say something which ultimately would proven to be mendacious. But it is to good purpose because it leads to disclosure. And that is far more important than whether Sean Kirkpatrick is going to give you a more of a hint or more of an open more of a door. He's the guy that's really got the big problem. And I have nothing but sympathy for Sean Kirkpatrick. Now, on the other side, so something like that, people hear that, oh, my God, they're going to give up. They're going to go away. I understand it. Our uh, trusting government is, 
incredibly low and well earned, and and that's a problem. But at some point, you got to trust somebody, or nothing happens. So let's take a look on the the the, bet, the the other side of the coin. In two days, you know what's going to happen? NASA is going to hold a four hour meeting and 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 briefing, right on the thirty first of May where NASA is going to discuss for a couple of hours kind of what's going on with that program they set up a while ago to look at the ET issue, the UAP issue rather, which of course had never happened before. The closest NASA ever got to this subject was being helping to set up SETI in the early days, which it was being funded through massive money. And SETI was that thing that had to be set up so NASA could proceed to do space stuff and not be bothered about, are you finding ETs? Are you finding ETs? SETI was basically a buffer program. The government knew there were ETs here when NASA was set up and when SETI was set up. But SETI told everybody, we're looking, we're looking. NASA is not really looking, but SETI is. And SETI's being funded by NASA, very awkward. So eventually SETI had to go out, get funded elsewhere. Okay, I get it. That's as close as NASA ever came. And then not long ago, it sets up another entity in NASA to look at the UAP and people are going, well, yeah, well, didn't, weren't they doing that all along? No, they weren't. And so now they're going to give a report on that, which we'll have to be careful. They're, Bill Nelson is not going to come out and say, yeah, we've been looking at it for about seven months now. And clearly we're up to our, you know, took us in ETs. No, he's not. And then they're going to take two hours of questions. That's amazing. People don't understand. In other words, history is happening in front of their eyes and they're going, I, I don't see it or, oh no, or whatever, I understand. That's why you have activists. That's why you have people like me that spend their entire life doing nothing but watch this so they can kind of get it and help people get it. So that's happening on the 31st. Right? And so what does that mean? Basically, it means, again, NASA is doing the right thing. It's doing what it's supposed to have done all the way back in the 50s or the 60s, right? And so people are gonna be more understanding when Bill Nelson finally goes up on the Hill, probably post-disclosure, to, to, uh, along with others, to, uh, how would you say, ask, ask, ans answer questions about the situation and the history of this issue in committee and in, in front of a committee, post disclosure. And Bill Nelson is going to be asked this question right away. Director, Administrator Nelson, Senator Nelson, Astronaut Nelson, when do you think the government or when did the government know about the ET presence? And the answer is going to be back in the 40s. Did you know about it when you were put into NASA? Yes. They're not going to lie. And people are going to say, wow, you mean you knew there was an ET presence, but you didn't do anything? I could not. It would have been illegal. NASA cannot go there. It's national security matter under the DOD. Had to have permission. Didn't do it. But now I can tell you, yes, we knew. And people are going to be, well, that's good, Bill. Hey, look, man. First of all, one of the reasons Bill was picked to be the administrator right after Biden came in is if you look at his background, he is the perfect administrator of NASA to be sitting in front of a hearing post-disclosure and answering that question. People are going to say, you know, Bill, you're a patriot. You're an astronaut. You're a fine, fine man. You've done the best you can. And we, we get it. We understood that you could not, you had to remain silent on this issue. He is not the only one that is going to have to do that. You're going to have person after person coming up on the Hill post-disclosure in hearings being asked questions like, sir, when did the agency know there was an ET presence? 1947, 1950, whatever. And, and again, the millennials won't care. The millennials are 30, 35 years old. They don't know the history of this issue. They could care less. They're only interested in what's happening right now. And what's happening right now is really exciting. And they're going, great, there's ETs here. I could give a crap. Whether, whether Blue Book was a phony program or not. I don't care about the Condon Report. I don't care about swamp gas. I'm only interested in this. The baby boomers like myself and some others and the hardcore researchers are going to be sitting there, you know, grinding their teeth going, hey, it's history. 
It's this issue is so much bigger than our hopes and dreams and desires, frustrations and anger. History is not going to give a damn. So un, try to understand that the process leading to disclosure is now paramount. And what Na NASA is doing, what Gil Gillibrand and the Senate is doing, what the DOD is doing, and what eventually the Air Force will be doing, they're dragging their feet. They will be the last people to show up at the party. You know, they're going to show up and going, okay, you know, we're 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 down with this. We're we're good because the Air Force's historical record on this is absolutely awful. And I'm sure they're just sitting there going, the that the the the, la the later we can finally you know have to deal with this, the better, right? Because it's going to be brutal for the Air Force. I I I don't I feel sorry for them. All of this is so that people, even people of my generation, will go, it's okay, we get it, but never do it again. Never can even think about embargoing massively important consequential reality and truth from us for national security reasons. We have every right to know and every need to know, and we can handle the truth every bit or better than you can. And I hope that will be a foremost uh, thing to say. I hope I get a chance to say that to a member of Congress in a hearing. I'm not holding my breath, but that's one of the things that needs to be emphasized post-disclosure. Let's don't ever do this again, for God's sakes. Really, it didn't go that well. And by the way, in that 75 years where you were keeping that secret because people would get upset, right, and, and be disturbed, what happened? 86,000 nuclear weapons were built. Untold dozens and dozens and dozens of trillions of dollars were spent on nuclear uh, 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 proliferation, bases, more weapons, interstitial wars, proxy wars, and on and on. The total amount could be 200 trillion bucks. And the entire time, every living person on this planet had to live under the threat of nuclear annihilation at any moment, meaning 2 a.m. in the morning, it don't make it to 6 a.m., right? And not, not just a, a problem, a, an awkward thing, apocalypse. It's walking dead, literally. You want kids? You want grandkids? You got to factor that in because they're probably going to be the walking dead. Every single person has lived under that Damocles sword for 75 years. And that didn't have to be the case, maybe. It's possible that had we had disclosure sooner, we could have taken a different path. But this argument that like we couldn't handle that truth, but we could handle living in a world with nine countries, 86,000 nukes, uh, it, capable of being delivered by air, by sea, suitcase case nukes, terrorist nukes, hypersonic nukes, orbiting nukes, that we can handle that. Oh my God, if we knew there was an extraterrestrial presence, we'd all fall apart. So yeah, it's going Great. to be awkward post-disclosure, but I'm going to try to be as generous as I can, and I hope everyone else will do the same. Wow. Thank you, Steve. Beautiful. That really puts it together. Zinka. Yeah, well, yeah, I was just commenting. Yeah, this is this is a delicate puzzle piece. And you can see with all the different agencies and all the different <laughs> infusions uh, and all the Careers different generations. And, and, and all the stuff is at stake for people. Yeah, yeah. everybody yeah. has still got a career to life and, and they don't want to be steamrolled by this historical event. I, I, I understand that as long as they're working to the right purpose. Let's let them, you know, have that opportunity. Yeah. So, so I want. To... I'm just saying, Steve is talking about the critical moment in human history where the wool is pulled from the eyes, and we see the truth on levels and levels. The, the nuclear proliferation fraud, even though they're building nuclear, what was that about? If they if they can't, uh, you know, no protect us from, or not even protect us if they're. There's things in our airspace. What are we defending ourselves against with a billion dollar budget? Steve's talked about this. So the fraud, the truth embargo will free all of us for maybe right government, right mm, purpose in the world, change our lives. And this is not just about aliens being here. It's about waking up to a one world, a humanity that 
can maybe a little more cohesive, a little more resonant, a little more friendly with each other. I think that's- I wouldn't want to get too utopian here. I mean, I I tend to go there myself, uh, Alan, uh, because most people go really utopian, that ain't coming. And that's true. It's not. But I can, here's what I will be saying. I'm going to go into this in great depth at, at the Contact in the Desert. We have a huge panel, amazing panel of eight people. I've got a lecture, we've got a workshop where I'm going to do nothing but take questions. I'm going to go into this in greater detail. But what, without getting too utopian, what I've tried to convey is fairly straightforward and debatable, I can assure you. I'll be happy to debate any fine professor, but they they don't want to be seen in the same room with me, I'm pretty sure. Uh, Is this. Circa... 2023, sooner really, but let's make it 2023. The human race in the span of 123 years, going back to 1900, has gone from a couple billion people to 8 billion. And its ability to support 8 billion has not kept up. It's also undergone and been involved in an extraordinary array of technological trends and advancements, profoundly changing the world around them. Okay, fine, that's okay. Unfortunately, these trends are so profound, we can't keep up with them either. Our impact on the world is profound and we can't keep up with that. In other words, the entire planet is ahead of its skis, way ahead out in front of its skis and getting ready to fall flat in its face and slide down the mountain and perish. It's existential. Really, it is. Uh, You could pick any number of things and they're they're existential in and of themselves, but in general, the collective is beyond, it's beyond description. We are screwed and have been for a while. We can't deal with this. We don't have the intelligence. We don't have the emotional IQ We don't have the political acumen to deal with the mess that we have created. We we can't even stop filling the the Pacific Ocean up with plastic. The garbage patch is getting bigger, not smaller. And pretty soon you'll be able to walk from Malibu to Japan. Wow. And guess what? All that plastic is causing cancer as we're starting to learn. And I could go on and on and on. In other words, When you look at the situation today, you don't see solutions. You get nothing but anecdotes. Uh, Somebody had that thing that they did, this little program. Oh, look how good that was. Oh, wow, that's really cool. I feel better about it. When in fact, the actual situation is beyond control. We hang on to anecdotes that somehow we're going to fix this. No, we're not. So, wow, what does that mean? It means that unless something really dramatic happens, the least of your worries is going to be whether Florida is underwater. That's not going to be that big a deal. There's far, far worse coming than that. When you have 2 billion people, minimum, who just don't have support, they don't have enough of what they have to have for food and clothing, and they live in absolute shit poverty. Two billion in a world where they know it, and they can actually even, no matter how poor you are, where you are in the world, you can probably find a, 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 a TV or a computer and you can watch the housewives of, you know, the, the, what is it? The something housewives of Hollywood. You can see all the wealth that you don't have. Eventually they're going to, how would you say, act. This has been going on for thousands of years. And they act in a lot of ways. Terrorism, coups, riots, God knows what. And they're going to do it in a world that's the most heavily armed in all of human history. The United States has 500 million weapons, most of which are civilian. That's about equivalent to the total number of weapons in all the other countries in the world, which means there's one trillion weapons in civilian hands without getting into the military weapons at all. And so the kind of chaos and stuff we see, the odd riot here, the odd riot there, oh, no, 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 no. There have been movies that have tried to project this, and you kind of get it, I understand. 
but we can't solve these issues. And then one more turns up every couple of years. The latest one is AI. Finally, it's getting the recognition it deserves. Apparently, the uh, Terminator series wasn't enough. I watched that. Apparently, a lot of other people didn't. And so AI is now coming at us like a tsunami. And you've got you know smart people going, oh, 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 no, it's, it's okay. It, it's going to create more jobs than, than, than it'll take away. And it's not going to, it's not going to, no, no. It's a technological paradigm shift of tsunami proportions that we haven't got a clue how the hell we're going to deal with it. And then we have a political dysfunction, which is rather extraordinarily awful, just in our country. But there's others that are, that are also bad, but in ours alone, it's really impressive how screwed up it is. And let me give you a metaphor. Just came up with this recently, I'm loving it. Here is my metaphor for how our political system works in this country, which may help explain why it's so bad and we can't get anything done and things are not going well. And why there's people all over the streets and where I'm living right now, sleeping on the benches, on the sidewalks, right? Wrapped up in blankets. Some don't even have blankets. They're just lying on the sidewalk trying to sleep in Los Angeles, okay? Here's the metaphor. It's year 2040. And our education system has continued to decline, right? Which it's doing. And finally, it reaches this point where here's how it's run. If you want to go to college, and boy, in a complicated world like this, you really need to go if you can. Not that there's anything wrong with being a high school grad, but you, you're going to need more education, not less. And if you want to go to college, you will by law be required to take the SAT test, the Scholastic Aptitude Test, which at one time was kind of the rule, though it's kind of softened, it's changed, but now it's, it's required. You have to take the SAT test. You don't go to college. And in order to, to take the SAT test, it will cost you $200,000. And if you don't have $200,000, you can't take the test, in which case you can't go to college. And so the people that have, get the 200000 they take the test, and the test scores are submitted. And then the Scholastic Aptitude Organization selects the bottom 20% of those who take the test, and they get to go to college. All right? And after people start to get this, you've got smart people that are paying the 200,000 and taking the test and deliberately answering the questions wrong so they can get in, dumbing themselves down. That exactly describes how the United States of the United, the United States of America selects its political leaders. And people wonder why things are not going well. But that's just one thing. All right. And so the point that I'm making is this. We have to have a massive change in thinking that is not just isolated to a country or a religion. It's got to be worldwide. It's got to happen fast because we're running out of time. And I'm, I invite anybody to come to me and say, I got, I got, I got it. I got it. You know, I got it. This, this is what we need. I will listen. If there's anything out there that even remotely comes close, I'll listen. But they don't have it. There's only one thing. It's time for us to know, as a global technological space-bearing civilization, what very much likely the Egyptians knew, the Syrians knew, the people that built uh, Gobekli Tepe knew, God knows, Incas, I don't know, whatever, in the ancient world, they knew, but it, 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 in a different time and in a way that it was completely uh, uh, not something that, that they, could, they could really work with. In fact, they just basically called them all gods. We have got to have that confirmed. We have to become aware that we are fully uh, uh, part of a, a galaxy that has more civilizations and we're being visited. Disclosure, that will affect the worldview of every living person. The good people, the bad people, the evil people, the rich people, the poor people, everybody's worldview will shift. And at that point, and also minds will open. Uh, all kinds of other areas will suddenly be worth considering because minds are going to open and they're going to, oh, you know, maybe I was wrong about this or not that, or maybe we should have known that, whatever. And in that atmosphere, in that period, post-disclosure, I'll give it a couple of years, we will have perhaps the opportunity 
to fix this stuff, right? To actually go, we need to fix that and we'll do it. We need to fix the politics, the education, the environmental impacts. We need to get rid of the nukes or whatever the hell. We need to stop having proxy wars. We need to stop building bio, bio weapons. We need to stop making economy war, meaning that China and the United States is at war economically because one's trying to get bigger than the other and we can't have all that nonsense. We have to rethink and hopefully fix as much of this as we can. We will have a short period of time. And if we don't get disclosure, we're not going to fix a damn thing. So that's one thing. But then there is the second thing. The second thing that I like to talk about is that there has been a, an agenda here on the part of the extraterrestrials from the get-go. There's always been an agenda, whether they turned up in 47 or whether they turned up in 3000 BC. They're not just casually here or what the hell dropping in. No, there's always an agenda. And part of that agenda is political. And what do we mean by that? I mean that their decision to engage us after the bombs in Hiroshima was a political decision. And it was pretty obvious within just a short amount of time, there's craft all over the place, particularly around our nuclear facilities. So many that there were crashes, right? For whatever reason. I think some of the, the entities were less technologically advanced, whatever they crashed, which was convenient in terms of you know getting the word out at least to us, and anyway, they, they, they're, they're all over the place. And so as we move forward with our nuclear weapons, they're watching all of this happen. And they know, and they knew as early as probably 1900, but certainly by the mid 20th century, where this was all going. And so in 1962, we had the Cuban Missile Crisis worldwide, watched by hundreds of millions of people. I was glued to my set for 13 solid days. And only a few years after that, ET craft started turning up over our nuclear weapons, ICBM sites, and turning the missiles off. Wow, what a coincidence. Not only here, but they did it in the Soviet Union. Wow, what a coincidence. Interesting, all right? And they, and they continued to have other nuclear weapons tampering engagements, making a case, obviously, that uh, we can turn them off. Why have you got them? Whatever. But it gets better because during that period, they started landing near schools. A lot of people know about uh, Ariel School in Rua, Zimbabwe. A lot of people know about the Westfall event in Australia. There have actually been more, a lot more, where they would land near school, come out, and they would give messages, psychic, psychological, you know, not, um, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, into the heads, putting messages into the heads of the kids about the destruction that could come, about the fact that we're at risk and we could destroy the planet and so forth. These kids are now in their 40s and 50s and probably trying to engage the issue. They were seeded, as it were, about this. Gee, these are not trivial things. There seems to be an agenda here. What could it be about? Could it be about nuclear weapons? Oh, you bet it is. All right. And so the decision to get rid of nuclear weapons is a political decision and they are facilitating it. And so I believe that there, to whatever degree they have assisted to advance the process where we could finally disclose their presence to ourselves in an orderly fashion is leading to something. What? Just disclosure? No. That's helpful. But we could have disclosure and build even more nuclear weapons. Who knows? We could decide, eh, there's ETs here. Screw them. We're going to screw up the planet anyway, because that's just how we roll. That's just what we do, right? And I think it's more than that. I think disclosure opens the door to open contact. And by open contact, I mean it kind of was happening a long time ago, but back then they were looked at as gods. They will not be viewed as gods this time around. Open contact could happen in two years or less after disclosure, which means it could be happening in 2025 if disclosure happens this summer. And in open contact is when finally the issue of nuclear weapons will get really addressed. If we haven't gotten rid of them by then, and we certainly will not have, is like Here's the deal. You know we're here. We're now talking to you openly. 
your 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 whole your entire world population knows we're talking to your leaders and leaders here's the thing uh we'd like to assist you you're ready to be part of a larger group the galactic federation as it were but we're not going to assist you we're not going to provide assistance and you need it god knows we can maybe be helpful but not if you keep the nukes why should we invest our time and resources in a, in a, into a civilization that is hell-bent on blowing itself to pieces? So, no, you don't get rid of the nukes, no help from us. And then, as a final point, you're close to interstellar ships. You're, you're very close to understanding how we get around this galaxy. And so you're going to build those puppies. And you're going to put your nukes on them because that's just what you do. And you're going to head out on the galaxy to see what you can see. And we're not idiots. That's not going to happen. You're never going to leave your planet or your solar system in interstellar craft with nukes on them or uh, photon torpedoes or whatever else you want to come up with. Because we're not that stupid. You become a risk to everybody else out there the moment you do that. And so we're just not going to let that happen. You build them, we'll blow it up. You build another one, we'll blow it up. You're not going anywhere unless you get rid of the nukes. And so finally, after 76 years of mutual assured destruction, madness on a level that no previous human civilization ever could, could, could reach, and we've done some pretty wild stuff going back thousands of years, finally, we will be forced to confront the fact that after 3 billion years of evolution and change and all of the millions and trillions of species that had to live and die and live and die and live and die in order for us to evolve to a point where we're sentient and could have a computer, that the idea of blowing all that up is really a stupid idea. And if we want to go forward, we've got to take care of our environment and our people and not spend four to $10 trillion a year on weapons of war and all of the other military intelligence crap. And that's a low number. I'm talking globally. It's probably more like 15 trillion, right? And that that's what will come about. That's where I think this is all going. And we'll make that decision. And we'll say, hey, we're keeping the nukes. Screw you. And they'll say fine. And we may not see them again, except when we build that ET, uh, that extra interstellar craft, and it suddenly blows up, right? And maybe they'll visit us again. Maybe they'll re revisit this issue with us. I don't know. But you want to talk about how profound this is? Just learning there's ETs here is tiny compared to the total picture that is behind the whole damn thing in our time. Not that the Egyptians didn't have some interesting stuff going on back then, right? And they were very impressed. And God knows what was happening because the ETs would have had a much la a greater latitude of action. but. Not now, not now. We're spacefaring, high tech. We have tremendous capabilities. We're brilliant. Our, G, our, our, our AI is gonna be even more brilliant. We're ready to join the rest of the galaxy. We just have to get over this little problem that we have. That's what's going on. That's why it's so much bigger than all of the disgruntled people on UFO Twitter and all the frustrated people that want it now and all the other issues and what have you that are being brought up, I get it. It's way bigger than that. It is virtually transcendent. Thank you so much, Steve, for that commentary. Uh, and we, you and I had done an interview at Conscious Life Expo, which we're going to release tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. We were going to play it out, but there's so much amazing stuff to talk about. And we also want to get to your questions, you guys. So again, if you're not in the Zoom room to ask questions for the last 20 minutes, I invite you to go to lightnet.org slash unlimited uh, to get the Zoom room. We do have a question here, but I just want to show you guys a little bit about what Steve brought to us. Um, during this interview. And I also want to show you his website. So the paradigmresearchgroup.org um, has a ton of resources here, articles, news, um, all sorts of things uh, that you can check out. So I encourage you to go into his um, massive amount of, of media research that he's done over the decades that he's been following and, um, and, and an activist in this um, in this in this vein. Can uh, I make a request? Could I ask you to do something for me? Yes, please. Because I think you're, you're, you're actually on the site. You're online, right? 
Yeah, we're on the site. Click, Where do click I go? On, go up and click on resources, please. Okay, great. Okay. Now slide on down to print media archive. Click. Right. Okay. Good. Now uh, go, you know, uh, scroll down a little bit and go to the punch through to print media archive. All right. Okay. Okay. Give it a little bit of time to come up and then scroll down a little bit, please. Okay. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. All right. Now, this is 2023 and at the top there's 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 every year going back to 1947 this is an archive of 13,000 print media articles from reasonable publications not fringe not crazy not you know not no no, no paranormal publication this is regular journalism 13,000 that you can read at your convenience. Each each year is word searchable. In other words, on this page for 2023, you could do a word search on this or that, and it'll jump down to the article. I, I'll do a word search on congressmen, and it'll jump down and, and, and give me the articles that have uh, the that in the title. 13,000. You see the years there? You see them? Uh, yeah, right. at the top here. Uh, yeah. in, in, 2000, in 2008, 16, there were 1,062, all right? So there's certain now some of these links are dead, uh, but I can I I have I've I've saved the articles and I can replace the dead links. It's just a very difficult job, and I'll get to it one of these days. But the point I'm trying to make is this 13,000 articles represents perhaps as little as 10 to 15 percent of all of the articles written on the subjects in 47, if you factor in foreign press, right? All the foreign articles plus all the articles that I cannot get links to that going back before 2006, as you go back in time, that the articles are no longer available through the internet. You've got to go in it literally into the, uh, uh, the, the uh, vaults or the storage facilities of newspapers and, and, and go into their microfiche. So the total number of articles that have been written in the world since Roswell could very well be up in the 80, 90, 100,000 articles. Now, why do I put bring this up? Well, one, this is an enormous research that I, I know that people could use. I mean, just in this year alone, if you read every one of those articles, you would be one of the, smart, one of the most informed people on this subject on the planet just by reading all the articles in 2023 or certainly 2022. So I um, invite people to take advantage of this, 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 this resource. Uh, and the, the point that I'm making is when somebody tells me that the truth embargo will always be around, they'll never tell us, they, they're, they, they're, they're just, they're committed to that. It's the deep state, secret state, separate civilizations, whatever. It's all run by, you know, hidden people that live underground, whatever. Please. Truth embargo is managed to stay in place since 1947, but there have been a hundred thousand perhaps articles on this, and most of them are available. You can go read them. How many people think that that, that it, with that being the case that this thing could just go on and on and on? Because what you see there wasn't even possible. 20 years ago, right? 13,000 articles available to anybody who has a computer anywhere in the world, assuming their government's not blocking their computer access. And so they could just go on, go to that site and start reading thousands of articles. Wasn't even possible. And guess what? If, if they bring up the article, it's, it's going to be in English. There's only a few foreign language there. And they go, oh, this is in English. And so they cl right click on the page and translate it into Mongolian or Swahili or Italian or French. Every site in the world is basically available now if you got the right browser in the language of your choice. And so this idea that, that the state is going to keep massive reality that is obvious and being shared, and they're going to keep it to themselves because they're the only ones that can handle this truth, is now beyond ludicrous. It's, it's not even ludicrous. It's so friggin' ludicrous. And, and this is a message that I think 
our fine leadership and our military and these very good people that particularly the ones that try to serve us, not the ones that are trying to essentially screw us, but they get it. They understand that and they know it's time to stop it. Yes, Thank indeed. You for and doing that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so we're going to put the link in the chat for everybody. Um, we're also going to take some questions, but I did want to just tease out this interview that we're going to be posting. Um, if you're in the Zoom room, we're also going to give you the Vimeo link, which we do have uploaded already. Um, but one of the things uh, we talked about, so one of the interesting things about uh, what Steve uh, talked about in the other interview was the fact that politically, this is a really interesting subject because both the left and the right want disclosure. And in the upcoming election and things like that, this can be an interesting choice point for us to really put, instead of protesting, uh, to do kind of a reverse protesting where we're, where Steve can help us identify who are the heroes in this. And when we tweet to them, say, thank you for um, thank you for working in this and doing disclosure. Um, that can be a really powerful act because everyone's going to want to be elected, right? So here's some of the people, um, Coffee put this together, of some of the people mentioned in his interview, which we're going to share out, John Podessa, Leslie Kane, Ralph Blumenthal, Chris Mellon, Luisa La Elizondo, Mark Rubio, Mark Warner, Steve Schiff, Senator Gillibrand, Andrew, uh, Andrea Carson, Tucker Carlson, um, uh, Mike Gallagher, Mike Allers, and Hillary Clinton. I'm reading those out because it's going to be hard for you guys to see that. But uh, but this is significant. And can you just touch upon the bipartisan? And then we also have a question here um, in the chat. Well, first of all, please send that to me. Right. I, I should have done yeah, that. I included it in the email, but I'll I'll send it okay. to you. Again. Okay. But good. Good. Great. I, I should have done that. But hey, congratulations. <laughs> Great idea. Yeah, we want to support you to, to do this and, and really support. So we've listed the um, Twitter accounts and things like that and the ideas to get this public on your website um, and our on our website too. And this list grows and maybe we can organize one, once a month or something where we really blast the Twitter accounts and things like that of, of our gratitude because this is, is going to be interesting because both sides want it, right? Again, this is uh, another example of why the inevitable is coming. Uh, virtually every member of Congress has a Twitter account. And some of them have direct message capability and some don't. But all you have to do is go at member, right? And then put your message in. And it's going to turn up on their feed. And so we now have the ability to send little messages to every member of Congress uh, in a way that's uh, not particularly intrusive. Emails are a little more intrusive. You're basically, the, the staff have got to go through the emails and check it, right? And then the email is private. But when you send a message on Twitter, a lot of other people see it. Some of these members of Congress have got hundreds of thousands of followers. And so when you praise, other people see the praise. And so when it comes to you know, social media, is not all bad. Uh, I'm on Twitter. I'm happy to be on Twitter. It goes up, it goes down. Don't care. It's one of the most significant inventions in human history. It's far more important to me than Facebook. So everybody can, has in a position to send little messages to their members of Congress uh, and journalists. Most of the journalists have Twitter accounts and, 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 and simply say, right on. Thank you. Great. We really appreciate what you're doing. We really want this truth. You're doing the right thing. This is not something that people do much of in our current society. The way things are, people are not, they're not disposed that way. Mostly they complain. I get it. And praising is a, a tiny percentage of the amount of complaints. But this is not a, a, like a behavior change so much. This is for higher purpose. I'm not suggesting that you become a praiser in your life and you're praising everybody wherever you go. That's probably a pretty good idea. But this praise could be profoundly important. You have a political class that's been savaged, rightfully, have made fools of themselves, uh, doing bad things. Uh, they're caught in a, a hyper-partisan vortex that they can't get out of. Uh, and so occasionally I feel sorry for them, but I, I lie down until that feeling passes. And so any praise is like gold. It's, it's, 
uh, ambrosia. I mean, oh my God, thank you. I've got 20 people telling I'm the biggest asshole in the country and you're, you just said I'm doing a great job. So praise has far more impact than criticism. People are fundamentally resistant to criticism. They, 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 they blank it out. They, they move past it as quickly as they can and they don't share it. They don't call people up and say, oh my God, I got this awful criticism. But praise is different. They, they, they react to that in a totally different way. And it makes them feel good and they share it. They'll tell other people, you know, I'm getting these really, really getting some great emails about this, uh, this policy or what I did last month. You know, it's kind of nice. I really appreciate that. And the other person's going, you got praise, praise, praise. What'd you get it for? What, 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 what? I want praise, praise, praise. I want praise. And it starts to spread. Now, I'm not talking utopia here. I'm simply saying that right now you have a political class that desperately needs praise. All right. Not hyper-partisan praise, all right? Uh, meaning, yeah, 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 you, you supported the, those guys doing that thing over there, and that was really good, because it's not that, because the person, that person knows that what's going on over there isn't good, but they're supporting it because they have to, because that's the political position they take. And so all they're getting there is kind of reinforcement of an awkward situation. But when it's legitimate praise of something that legitimately deserves to be praised, Meaning, thank you for trying to get the truth to us. Thank you for not uh, uh, simply capitulating to this policy. Thank you for doing the right thing. Uh, we we do have a need to know. We want to know, and it's and it's totally nonpartisan. There isn't a partisan component to that at all. And so this is praise not from one of your followers. It is just praise from people regular people that think you're doing a good job. And a lot of those people that are praising you, you probably know, are on the other side of the political aisle, might even hate my politics, but they recognize this is a, an important and a good thing. I cannot tell you the effect that could have if the American people really got going with that. And I'm not talking about machine-driven stuff where you, you know, you're just flooding it. I've done that. It's, it's, it's called good trouble, right? I'm talking about just dropping some of those notes in, okay? A little here, a little there. Going on Twitter, finding the journalist that just wrote an article, send them something nice. Believe me, it will help to ensure not only that this will get done in a timely way, but that the aftermath of it, as people are sitting there going, wow, we did it. And I had all that support. And, and, and now people are going to want more and I'm going to give it to them. And then in the post-disclosure world, oh yeah, the praise has got to keep going. Every time somebody in a hearing asks the right question or any time the president gets something released or anything that helps further our, our body of knowledge on this issue, boom, out go those praises on Twitter or whatever else. You can send an email, something along with that. You can do that too. Don't call them because the office is, it just jams up the phone line. Send a letter. That's okay. But the, 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 the social media is the fast and easy way. Load them up with praise every time they do something wrong. Right, rather. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay? Yeah, it's Try so the good. End. The okay. other thing that I really loved about the interview, which we're not going to talk about because I want to get to a few questions before we close, is that you really describe in this interview um, – what the post-disclosure world looks like. So I invite you guys to go to the YouTube channel, lightnet.org slash, um, I'm sorry, YouTube slash our lightnet to check out the interview tomorrow. It'll also be up on Can TV. So we have a couple questions here. Um, the first one comes from Orlando, um, from B. Vinicus, and she says, question, um, are you guys pro or con the Greer movement, which hasn't been mentioned here, but seems to be a major tip of the spear of disclosure? Yes. Any comments on the June 10th Washington, D.C. event? Um, well, I, I don't I, I don't share the idea of a Greer movement. Stephen Greer, Dr. Greer, has been involved in this issue for 30 years. And he has done an enormous amount of work and made enormous contributions. He is complicated. He's also well-funded, so he can just do things that others can't. 
And I think history will very much understand the importance of some of these contributions. Every activist that comes to this field brings to them certain resources, personalities, and complexities. What's important to me is simply that Dr. Greer has been working for disclosure for as long as I've known him. And so I support that. Does that mean, and, and this is true of many, many of the colleagues, does that mean that I necessarily agree with everything that they, they, they may say or the approach that they may take? Of course not. Every major activist movement, in, in it, certainly in the 20th century, believe me, is filled with an array of individuals taking different approaches and what have you. And what's important is not whether there's some sort of uh, complete unification, right, of thought, but rather that they get the job done. And we're getting the job done. I may or may not attend uh, the Washington thing because I'm in California and, and I may not be able to get out there. But if I can, I will. This is, uh, I, I suspect there's going to be some very significant things that are going to take place. And it's in the National Press Club, which I have a very fond, great fondness for. And I've been a member of the press club for 30 years. So I may go. All right. Uh, so again, I am supportive of everyone in this field that is to their best ability and in the context of who they are, who are trying to get an end to the truth embargo, period. Yeah, yeah. We have another question here um, from Jennifer that came in and then we'll go to Todd. Jennifer says, um, there's many who believe that everything the government says is a lie. So even when they do disclose the truth about ETs, many may even still find it unbelievable. <laughs> so that's kind of a funny thing. And then they she asked like, is the second phase of disclosure where ET will come in and communicate with us more directly so that even if people don't trust the disclosure that the, the government is saying that that it would be um, still the truth would be known. You remember the fable at the end, the villagers just wouldn't believe the shepherd boy. He said the wolves were back again. And so they didn't do anything. And the wolves came in and they ate the shepherd boy, the sheep and all the villagers. Um, the process in which we reverse the distrust trend in governments, particularly in our government, is, is doable. Uh, and, and I believe it can happen. Keeping in mind there are other countries where the distrust in the authority is even greater than ours countries worse than ours, with more even more authoritarian regimes than our, where, where they, they don't believe any. We're not there yet. Thank God. We're kind of going in that direction, but we're not there yet. Uh, and the when, when disclosure happens, these are smart people. The, the Pentagon and the, the CIA have been gaming this issue for decades and decades. They have been gaming out how it could be done, what will the post-disclosure be like. They are well prepared. You may not know it, but they are. Uh, and so I, I, I think that the decision will be clear that this is your opportunity to bring trust back to government, to re a gain confidence of the American people who have been pretty generous with the United States government until how it conducts its affairs, to say the least. This is your opportunity to do it. And it's not going to be that difficult on the ET issue. And, and, and the ET issue offers an opportunity of grand scale, meaning it, it's not just a truth, it's a mega truth. And so I assure you, they will provide in short order not, not that there isn't enough evidence for the ET presence, there's piles of it, right? But they will provide their own stash of stuff, which will be absolutely compelling. There, there will be no doubt. I know there are people that think we didn't go to the moon and the earth is flat. That, that's not that much of a problem. The vast, vast, vast majority of people will be convinced by their governments that this is confirmed because we won't be the only government that's revealing information. 
there will be others. And so you're going to have reinforcement. And so, yeah, it's going to be a mega truth that people are going to believe it. And then they have the governments have to decide, are we going to work from that? Okay. Or it's going to be, okay, we told you that truth. Now we got to get back to the lying thing. You know, that's just the way we operate. We got to lie, 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 lie. And, and I, I don't think so. And so you're looking at a paradigm shift possibly in the relationship between U.S. people and their government and maybe in a number of other countries. Uh, lying, manipulation, secrecy, all this kind of stuff, it's been going on for thousands of years. It doesn't end well. It never ends well. And so that's just one of many huge transformations that could take place as a result of what is happening right now, which is why I try to remain humble in the face of it all. Yeah. Uh, so we have one final question before we close. Uh, and I also wanted to uh, also give everybody a chance. If you're watching on New Realities or Portal to Ascension or LightNet, go ahead and like and subscribe. Alan was just texting to me like, this is one of the best interviews that Steve has done. He, you know, so much information has been packed into it and it's such a critical time. Uh, he's also texting me like, maybe we do another watch party for the NASA thing on Wednesday. Um, do you know what time that's going to be, Steve? 10.30 to 2.30 Eastern time. Okay, great. 10.30 to 2.30 Eastern time. So streamed on um, YouTube, you think, Steve? Uh, if you, if you, if you, it, it's going to be on NASA TV and a couple of other things. Uh, if you Google it up, if you do, if you do a Google search on NASA May 31 UFO briefing, something like that, uh, you actually get the NASA release and they, they list, but it's not going to be in, unless CNN or some of these entities jump in on this. I mean, I don't know, but, and, and I don't think they would necessarily know, but they did indicate it's going to be on NASA TV, which I think everybody can access. Right. Great. Yeah. Point. I'm going to put the link I just found in the, in the chat. So yeah, I love this as like, you know, like you were saying at the beginning of this interview, it's like we're all marching toward all the hearings that have to happen before, you know, the president can can release it. So um, the final question here, um, Todd, I couldn't get in touch to um, to come on, come up and, and so I'll just read his question. So mm -hmm. how would disclosure cha change the behavior of geopolitical actors and their current wars? as well as the behavior of energy industrialists when these actors may be aware of non-human intelligence and favored self-interest anyways? Okay, that's the last question, huh? Yeah. Right. <laughs> I who, know you're going to like this one. Who's going to order the pizza? <laughs> <laughs> well, I want wings. I want pizza. Uh, this is the $64,000 question. I've touched on it. Yeah. I touched on it a little bit. Um, uh, Bryce Abel and, and certainly uh, Richard Dolan and AD touched on it. I recommend everybody read that book. I need to read it again. Others are starting to stop, talk post-disclosure. I'm on a lot of mail lists. You're starting to see it turn up. It's not turning up at the Ford Foundation or RAND or, or uh, the Quincy Institute or these other think tanks, but it will. Uh, because the understanding what could happen in the post-disclosure world, understanding how we could shape, in other words, not just what's gonna to happen to us, but how we could actually shape what happens ourselves, both at the national level, continental level and everything else, is gonna require the collective intelligence and efforts of a whole lot of people. And because the issue is so nonpartisan, not only politically within our country, but basically globally, um, I just, it's hard. I can't, I can't imagine China taking a, a uh, how would you say, territorial attitude or, or any country, meaning, you know, well, we, have, we are aware of the situation and we'd like to inform you that the extraterrestrials are here specifically to deal with us. Uh, and we have, uh, we've trademarked um, um, uh, the post-disclosure dinghy or whatever the hell, and just here for, no. I think every country will recognize that they are here, they're dealing with the planet and that no one is really special here. No country, no ethnicity, no race, no political position is preeminent. It's the planet. And so they 
they they very likely will have the license to address it from what amounts to a strictly human perspective. Um, and that's just, I mean, my God, I could go on for hours, but let's just get a couple of fundamentals, a couple of fundamentals. And this is stuff, by the way, this is fantastic practice for me because I've got this lecture I'm doing in CITD and like now it's going to be even better than I thought it was going to be. And that's cool because you see, when I do lectures, I don't script anything. I just pick a beginning point and an end point and I go in and I just do it. And I'm hearing it for the first time that the audience is. So it's as exciting for me as it is for the audience. Um, we, we will learn, of course, that there are other civilizations. And they can travel around. We're not the only ones. Okay. And in that instance, the, the, the logical thing is how do we compare with them? Everybody does this, right? You move into a house in a neighborhood and very quickly, you're going to start comparing your house to the other houses. I mean, it's just, what you're going to do that. And, and you're going to respond to that. So we're not alone. We're also not all that special, though we are unique in a lot of ways. And now we have to think in terms of us with respect to the, this other, this other other reality, the rest of the galaxy, which of course we could spend. I'm sure any civilization could spend a trillion, uh, hundreds of billions, if not billions of years, exploring it and not explore at all. I mean, that's how big it is. And so, at that point, everything is put into a different perspective. It's like in Gulliver's Travels. The Lilliputans, one of the things that they really were obsessed with and got into all kinds of conflict on was which end of the egg to break, the small end or the big end. And it was a big deal for the Lilliputians. That's you know, why it was such a great book. There was a lot of stuff like that. In it. I, can tell, I can assure you that a great deal of what goes on on this planet today is basically at the same level of which egg do you crack, which end of the egg do you crack. Suddenly, that stuff seems... Really, so really unimportant. And so it, people and nations are going to be re, re changing their thinking as to what is important and what is not important. And so if you are a member of the political class of a particular country, I'm not going to name names here, and you are convinced that your method of, of government and your people are the people and the government. And it's only a matter of time when you will run the whole show and this will be your planet. You're going to have to go, so what? The universe is not going to care an iota about your aspirations. And the fact that you might be the, the, the top dog on this planet, you're not the top dog in this universe, not even close. And so this new perspective means, hmm, and fundamentally it comes down to this. We're one human race. We are the final result of a very complex series of evolution in which many, many homo species had a shot at you know, owning a Mac. Uh, they didn't make it, for whatever reason. There was probably some competition, maybe a little how would you say, uh, intended extinction stuff, but mostly they just didn't make it. The evolutionary trend didn't quite service them. We are the result of that, and we are the only technological species on the planet. Now, we're not the only sentient, we're the only technological species, right? And we are a human race. That's what we are. And our home is the galaxy, which I'm going to be talking about at great length in my lecture, though I'm not sure what I'm going to say yet. This is our home. And we have neighbors. We have friends. We have, we have people out there that, that know we're here, that engage us. We are a human race. And so how committed should we be as a human race to taking a path where environmentally 
we could easily kill off massive numbers of our fellow brothers and sisters, or using the weapons of mass destruction we are continuing to build in advance, kill them off with those. Why? What? To impress ourselves? To show how mighty we are to those that we allow to survive? Like Genghis Khan crossing the plains of, of Asia, letting a few people live but killing most everybody else so they wouldn't come back later and try to kill him. And it amounted to what? It amounted to the fact that about, I don't know, 97% of all the people in Asia got a little uh, Genghis Khan DNA in them. The universe doesn't give a crap. Not even a little crap. All right. And so this, this perspective change, which I assure you is going to be the subject of endless TED Talks and, and, and debates and, 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 and lectures and all over the world because everybody's unleashed, right? I'm, I'm just pre-unleashed. <laughs> I unleashed myself ahead of time. The point is, it's going to be incredibly intense and this stuff is going to be debated, right? And so all of this, you know, this feel-good stuff that we, we try to, you know, get into once in a while about we're all one and we sing the songs and we hold the, you know, the, you know, the, the, the music conferences to help this and help that. I get it. But in us, there is this sense, even in the worst of us, that this oneness of being a human race and being the most sentient species and thus, whether we like it or not, have the ability to hold the fate of our environment and our planet in our own hands, no other species can do that, that that's, that's a big deal. And possibly we need to service that. It's just as human being. Now, does that mean that everybody is going to rid themselves of their unpleasant biases, outrageous uh, attitudes and so forth post-disclosure? No, not at all. It means, though, that governments will start serving our higher good and make it easier for people who are on the fence to choose good. And over time, particularly if governments do their job and the environment is served and people have enough food to eat and water to wash with and clothing and shelter, that the number of people with higher purpose in this world, the percentage, the ratio will start shifting in the right direction. And it won't take a couple generations of that. And you just may have one real happy planet, all right? That's uh, one way to talk about the post-disclosure world. And that's the short version, let me tell you. So, you know, um, you know, see how that goes. I'll probably have some other ideas by, uh, look, Steve, by the weekend. Steve, you've been great. And I really see more and more of your humanitarian um, efforts in what this whole disclosure movements about it's not it's yes it's about aliens so it's about bringing us together as you know not um shangri-la but uh human beings that are here to work together for a world where we can all live a little better happier and healthier so i really appreciate this bigger perspective and you know we are at act three you know where the that moment in in history or in theater where like the the shift happens, you know, Dorothy goes back after seeing the wizard and the wizard says, no, go back and get me the broomstick of the witch. And, and so we're right there at this critical point and you're one of the people to follow. Um, there's some other great people out there, UFO Joe on Twitter. I really like, I really like Ryan on the post-disclosure world. There are these players in the field that have taken up the torch dedicated their lives to this, Linda Moulton Howe, uh, Richard Dolan, Grant Cameron. These are, you know, our all-star team. So this, this, this conference coming up, I think is really is going to be spectacular as people come together and network and community is built and we see where we're all at. But I just was hoping, it's sort of, I know you said the last question, but what do you see in the next few months, lay out the scenario. And I know you've done this a hundred times over the past years, but what's coming down the line? You know, we have NASA, we have another Congress hearing. Just lay it out a little bit. Before I do, though, I just want to mention something. Life is funny. <clears throat> Two thirds of my life, nothing was happening. <laughs> it 
nothing was going well, nothing was working out. All my limitations were in full force. Uh, and then I got into this field. Uh, and the last 26 years have been pretty extraordinary. I, I, I came in with limited resources and some liabilities because the first two thirds were so, I would just say not productive, but whatever, I got here. But uh, my mommy and daddy conceived me seven months after the bombs dropped in Japan. I was born seven months before the Roswell event took place. My entire life, I have lived under the truth embargo and the nuclear arms race and mutual assured destruction. I sort of knew this young, when I was young. I had a sense of it. I don't know why. Uh, Navy kid, Navy military brat, Navy father, you know, warrant officer, nothing special. Uh, not really exposed to much of anything. And yet somehow, I was seeing things in a way that I, I don't, I can't explain why. It wasn't coming from some obvious source, just whatever. So I've lived my entire life under these two, uh, or, or, or during this time of these two extraordinary, unprecedented trends. The nuclear arms race, which outdoes anything the human race has ever tried before. It's, it's top, top stuff. And the, the escalating or the modern presence of ETs, which is clearly of a type un, un, different from any other engagement they've had with us in our time on this planet. Both together. But it wasn't until, not that, well, it wasn't until maybe 2000, after I'd been kind of getting into about four years, that I started to realize that these two incredible historical trends that have been virtually begin, right, with my conception and birth, have been moving forward in time, intertwining like the helix of the human gene, wrapped around each other, playing off of each other. The two dominant things in my, my, my view, in the world, are the most not most dominant, most implicative things in the world, in a world that's filled with all kinds of implicate stuff. Uh, and it is, it not does not surprise me that as we approach disclosure, hopefully this summer, when we are at the closest we have ever been to disclosure, I assure you, we have never been this close not even remotely this close. At the same exact time, we are the closest to nuclear war we have ever been. The Bulletin of Atomic Scientists has the clock at 11 seconds to midnight, unless they've moved it even closer. And I assure you, if a tactical nuke goes off anywhere in the Ukrainian you know, uh, a war, it'll go to five seconds to midnight. And so both of these things are coming to a make or break point at the same time. That can't be an accident. The question that remains is to what extent is this final outcome strictly in our hands or to what extent do the ETs have a play here and how far are they willing to go? which is pretty cool when you think about it. I mean, it would make for one hell of a play. But again, the third act is about these two things coming to a head. Which is going to happen first? Are we going to disclose the extraterrestrial presence to the world? That's midnight on my paradigm clock, which I published initially in 1997, or the nuclear war that we've been uh, dancing with uh, which begins in 1947 has been chronicled since then by the Bulletin of Atomic Science. So I just want to mention that. Now, to answer your question, uh, thank you. Thank you for that. I expect a lot of different things to happen, but the one thing I am most keyed on is the announcement of the hearings. Uh, it could happen at any time. Uh, I knew it wasn't going to happen until the budget thing was, uh, the, the debt thing was done. That's done. Uh, I'm going to check to see if, if the Congress is in session. 
uh, or what their schedule is going forward. Uh, I think an announcement will probably not happen uh, if they're out, out, out of town, meaning they won't announce, okay, when we get back to town, we're going to have this hearing. I think they'll announce it while they're in town. Uh, if they do announce it, it will be a it will be a short short term thing. In other words, they won't be okay. We're going to hold hearings in August. No, it'll be like we're going to hold hearings next week. Uh, we know that plenty of witnesses have been already interviewed by Arrow. There's been plenty of time for the congressional committee staff to interview them. In fact, there was a a uh, one of the things that was brought up in uh, the letter uh, that was sent was don't forget that what you're learning from these, these uh, witnesses that you're interviewing, basically pre-interviewing for hearings, you need to tell us about that. All right, that was in the, it was, that was in the letter, right? Pretty, pretty significant. And so uh, there is nothing to prevent uh, Senator John, uh, Warner, the chairman of the Intel Committee to announce that they're, they're gonna hold hearings say in seven days. And we know the witnesses they're gonna bring up I know the witnesses, a lot of the witnesses are going to bring up, and I know what those witnesses are going to say, and I know how much coverage there's going to be of these hearings. It will be unprecedented. More people will watch this hearing than any other in history, and it's going to literally blow everything sky high in terms of this embargo. It'll just blow it completely up. And maybe that's a wrong. Let, let me back off. I, that's that's a that's a violent metaphor. Let me let me let me change this. It will literally transform the public and, and the public view, citizen view. It will transform the journalist view, and it will certainly transform uh, the political view on this. And as a result, in 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 a short order, uh, I think the president will be in a position. And he's staying out of this, by the way, absolutely wise. He doesn't want to touch this at all if he can and let it come to him. That's what it has to be. It has to come to the president for him to go, oh, I have watched all of this with you and we have come to the conclusion. This confirms what many have suspected. It's non-human technology, non-human entities. So th this will, this is what is going to happen. And, and so the next thing is the hearings. That's, that's key. We haven't had a hearing since 68. These other things were briefings. They were not hearings. Oaths were not taken. The last hearing was 55 years ago, right? So we're overdue. And the expectation level is just off the charts. And so that's what to expect. Anything else will be part of the process. There might be another briefing from, from uh, Kirkpatrick. He's about to uh, hire a, a an assistant director. They may bring that assistant up, talk to them. There'd be another member of Congress may come forward and say, yeah, I'm pretty sure the ETs are here. And there'll be a lot of that kind of stuff. But the one thing that matters is which chairman of which committee is going to announce the first hearing for the witnesses that they've been interviewed. That's what I got. This Thanks. is so exciting, you guys. <laughs> Go ahead and share and like this video. This is in tr truly good news. This is truly good news. Uh, so exciting. Uh, thank, uh, thank you. Of course, you know, this could go on and on because we haven't even talked about the contactee questions, but I know, Steve, you have a lot to do and we can do a whole other program about it. Uh, no, I don't actually. I, I I got all day. You guys want to go on? I'll go on. It's, it's, your, it's your call. This is my job. This is what I'm supposed to do. So I'll let you decide when it ends. And if it's fine, if it's no, now. Thanks, it's uh, how, how much do you want to go on? Because we just had. I'll go on as long as you want. We just this had. Is my job. This is what I, I, mean, I do. I was also going to say, like with the contactees, you know, um, we're about to get ready for our season four labs. And, you know, we just uh, got some stuff printed for the, the uh, for the contact in the desert. And, you know, research on this is in the government and then it's also in us, you know what I mean? And so we really feel that it's important for all of you people listening out there, you know what I mean? This isn't a movie that we're watching on TV. This is something that you guys can engage in. You know, we just did a massive CE5 the other night. You know, we're doing that. We are putting together, you know, radio contact. This is measurable scientific 
things, working on a map to tie all the different organizations, the new fork data, you know, all the different data together so that we can put these experiences into a quantifiable um, storyline that brings us to want to um, get the nukes off the ships. You know what I mean? Like, or, you know what I mean? Because th that really sunk in when you said that, that you were like, well, the ETs don't want us tying our weapons to this interstellar stuff because that's just not gonna fly. So it's like, it's interesting. So all this stuff has to happen. And, you know, Alan, um, our, our team start in three weeks. Um, these are a great opportunity, remote viewing, ham radios, light language, art, crop circles, soul travel, waking induced lucid dreaming, intuition, and Eastern Je Jedi practices. This is at lightnet.org. Um, yeah, yeah, Alan's doing some great research. Why don't you just explain to Steve and maybe everyone else just exactly what you mean by this uh, research and these different contact modalities? Because I don't, you know, Steve is so involved in what he's doing. I don't think he knows about what you're talking about. Yeah, so we we believe that this stuff is too unbelievable unless you have an experience. And so we go, well, how do you have an experience? Well, when you study who's had experiences, it usually happens in a small loving group. You know, these people are scared to talk about it. They're scared to have experiences. They don't want to be ostracized. You know, all that stuff has been happening. So we know that when you put someone in a small team of eight to 12, they start to relax and go, oh, well, maybe, um, maybe I could have an experience. What does this look like? You know what I mean? So the U.S. government is using remote viewing to look at off-planet sites, but how do you do it? And is that real? Well, we want you to answer that question for yourself. We don't want you to read about it. We don't want you, you know what I mean? How does it work? And Alan walks you through how to do that, right? How the military's done it, how we can do it. And then we want to use citizen science to really pull this data together into a single place to benefit the rest of humanity, right? So if, if, if most of the conversation in the government is about military reasons for, for ETs, I mean, there's so much more than that. There's healing technologies. There's all these fun things that are gonna happen when we have this Renaissance. So again, um, we take these teams, we've had people wanting to make ET contact and we're at a 96 percentile success rate. So because the teams are small, they're eight to 12, you can't, you know, you're going to get individual attention. You're going to get individual support. There's an intention that happens. So we really investigate consciousness uh, and in a really fun way uh, and in a practical way. And Alan's putting together an off-planet database of off-planet remote viewing. And we're getting 14 people in the same class seeing the same thing. I mean, this is high strangeness. <laughs> I'm just using the protocol that the government has used and taught to me by Russell Targ to see, okay, if we can remote view the same target on planet Earth, we know what the target is and get a consensus among a group of eight. Oh yeah, we've all seen the same target. And what if we go off planet? I know it's a little out there for what you're doing, Steve, because you're much more grounded, but can we people have an experience of this non-local consciousness by seeing a UFO, seeing who's in there or going to... Uh, Trappist one and seeing what the web might be tuning into. So it's just helping people have an experience of a of a non local reality, but it, it it's different than you, you grounding the concrete areas of 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 government into this. We're taking it more on a personal level, and it, it's a separate thing. But people are doing this with dreams or. Zynga has these radios that just went wild the other night when we saw some UFOs out, out in the desert. So um, it's a different approach, but it's the, it's the contactee realm that um, needs to be included. I'm hoping it will as this uh, disclosure progresses, they'll call up people like Travis Walton or Whitley Strieber or some of the really um, well-known cases say, yes, this has been my experience and there's no denying it, it's document, all that. So that's sort of the angle, Zinka with LightNet and I'm helping with that. 
And there, and and now that the government can and the military can report, they're reporting. You know what I mean? So it's they wanted to report. This is not an isolated UFO that happens like seventy years ago. So that's you know. Yeah, let me come in here first of all. <laughs> yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm I'm aware of all these things. I, I I have my my work. I mean, I'm an activist and I'm dealing with a political resolution. I'm aware of all this other stuff. I assure you. I've talked yeah. with lots of contractors. Yeah. And uh, I talk about it. Uh, but I understand that the process underway, that's not going to be uh, on the menu. Yeah. But it may be the dessert. Right. Uh, so, uh, but that was even back in, uh, 20 years ago, talked about it. When you, when you, once you look into the contact the issue, what you find, uh, and you learn very quickly, is that ETs are telepathic. Just the fact that they're telepathic is a huge deal. Okay. <laughs> it's a really big deal. Uh, and and without getting into how telepathic they are with each other, we know that they can read our mind and they can put images in our mind. So that we, we, we know that they can do that, but more importantly, we know that we can receive it. In other words, as I've said before, we can receive messages and they can take, they can get messages from us. We just can't control the process. We don't have the knobs on the radio. And so our brains are capable of receiving brain-to-brain -brain communication. Now, I was long, long ago, it's been years, uh, and I haven't, it hasn't been repeated, I don't think, but about maybe 20 years ago, somebody, I forget who it was, took me aside and said, look, one of the principal reasons that the truth embargo hangs in there is that early on, I mean, 47, they would have known, they had a live ET from Roswell. So, and by the way, it's, I assure you, there are plenty of contactees in government and, and at the DOD and, and the intelligence services. And within the intelligence services and the military, uh, it would, th these people would have been highly prized. It wouldn't be, oh my God, you're a contactee. We're going to muster you out of the service. Oh, no, no, no. You're a contactee. We have a program we want to get you involved in right now. So they have been dealing with contactees within their own ranks for decades. Okay, so telepath telepathy. It, it's reasonable to conclude, just based on our own research and just common sense, that if ETs can communicate brain to brain with us, it won't. It's very only a matter of a little more understanding and a few twe twe tweaks here and there, and we can communicate the same way. And for certainly authority back in the 50s, 60s, the idea of having a population which was developing telepathy is terrifying. Mm -hmm. You see the problem with that, all right? Yeah, yeah. Not to mention the marriages that will go down. I mean, uh, so uh, well, it's just, and, and, and for that reason alone, they said that is sustaining the truth embargo. Now, true, not true, don't know. Logical to some degree. Uh, and what would it be like if we started developing telepathy? First of all, it would take time before it would become very broad, but it would be, you talk, you know, you talk about, Chat GPT uh, and AI being a disruptive thing. Imagine if, for whatever reason, we figure out how to become telepathic, and millions of people started becoming telepathic by 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 going through whatever protocol, and they can read strangers' minds. Unless at the same time, you can also be trained to turn it off and turn it on. You see the problem. It is a real game changer. All right, so we know about that. Yeah. Uh, but more importantly, look, years ago, there were a few programs in the United States by some stalwart academics to, to look into telepathy. One of the most famous programs was at Duke. There was another program at Princeton, a uh, Temple, I mean, Temple University, the, where David Jacobs taught. His his little ET course, kind of as a side deal. He once told me, I said, I said, David, have you had any problems? He said, No, but 
I'm an associate professor and I will never be a full professor. And he retired as an associate professor. Uh, they were all shut down. Eventually they shut them down and they weren't re-upped. Okay. Guess what happens post-disclosure? Post-disclosure post is a shock to every closed mind on the planet. And suddenly the minds are going to open up and they're going to realize it's time for us to start taking a bigger, uh, larger view of things. It's time for us to really pay attention to a much broader spectrum of things out there. And so research engagement in every aspect of what is called the paranormal. And as I've said publicly many times, there is no such thing as the paranormal. The universe is completely normal, absolutely normal. Okay. There's just things know we know and things we don't know. Well, and so the, it will be the golden age. Now th there will be abuses and silliness and nonsense is going to go on and there's going to be the con here and a con there and whatever. But in terms of the academic world, the scientific world, and just intelligent people, well-educated, intelligent people, it will be the golden age of examining and, and seeing uh, about these range of things that we don't fully understand, which is maybe it's going to be a really interesting time. And it's going to be fun, right? Uh, in terms of contactees, the stigma publicly is virtually gone. There's still some people out there that use some of the old language, believer, uh, a, a, a very intelligent uh, a professor just wrote an article in a major publication where he referred to us in this field as tin foil hat believers. So there's still a little that, but basically the stigma is gone. But that's in the general public arena in a sense. Right. That doesn't mean that if you're having dinner with your extended family, you know, over the holidays and you bring up the fact that, you know, I've been meaning to tell you this, folks, but I, I've been getting visited by ET since I was 12, that you're not going to have a problem. So it's it's gone. I think in the more public level, it's going to take a while for this stigma to leave pretty much all the way down into close relationships. But it's that's going to happen, too. And mm -hmm. and all of the work that contactees are doing, uh, all of the CE5 stuff which is one of Greer's great accomplishments. He's the one that, that put that out there uh, ahead of most everybody else and devoted huge amounts of effort, time, and money to do it and, and made it a thing. Others have joined. Uh, all of that is what I call pre-disclosure preparation. Right? Right. It, is, it is helping to open minds. It is getting people involved. Uh, and, and so it is, it is, it is adaptive. Uh, in some countries, you, you, can't, you can't do it. But in most of the Western world, you can. Uh, and, and also in Russia, you can do that. So there's, that's pre-disclosure adaptation. Now, post-disclosure is when the entire contactee world will have an extraordinary opportunity to uh, affect history. They, they will be sought after. Mm -hmm. They will be in great demand. They will politicize. You will see contactees coming together and forming PACs, maybe a think tank or two. Uh, they're going to be listened to, and they're going to have a significant impact on what takes place in the post-disclosure world. Because the day after the announcement, everybody out there is going to go, who do I talk to to find out what the ETs are like? And it ain't the Secretary of Defense. It's contactees. And then the only problem we're going to have there is there's going to be a lot of people pretending to be contactees who aren't because they just really want somebody to pay attention to them. I get it, right? But pretty soon we'll start to know. The total number of contactees in the planet is probably in the tens of millions. Uh, the vast majority of them have no memory. But because there's so many in play, some of them do get memory. Uh, and of course, they can retain memory. They can get memory also through hypnosis or just leaks. And that's, I think, just the fact that it's an imperfect process. But the actual number that have had contact may end up proving to be astounding. Now, to what extent those memories could be reclaimed or they'll come forward, I don't know. But the number that will come forward will be a very large number. And so you're going to have in the post-disclosure world, as we're trying to adjust 
a whole lot of individuals that can give us firsthand accounts of what the ETs are like, what they went through, how they adapted, right, and so forth. And this is important. It may be that part of the contactee reality that the ETs are engaging in is precisely for that, is one of the reasons why they do it. It's not the only one, though. But it's maybe they know full well the role that contactees will play in the post-disclosure era, which is where we're headed. All right. Well, Steve, I just want to acknowledge that the fact that you have made a really important distinction between the pre-disclosure world and the post-disclosure world. You are one of the stars of the pre-disclosure. But the post-disclosure world, when they say really they were abducting people, they were changing time flows, they were uh, here, what's their technology? How can, what's our true history? What's the, how, how can they help us with disease and illness and all these things, the post-disclosure world is, is ground zero. It's where we should have started from 75 years ago. And yeah. we have, we're getting there to the post-disclosure world and the nature of reality, which I'm so excited about, is totally different than the pre-disclosure nature of reality. And that's what's so exciting to me as well. Yeah, now, not everything that the, the ETs are doing is, is uh, what I would call comfortable. Right. Uh, as, as I'm gonna make this point, the, the most important thing is political in my view, but they're doing other stuff. And people say, well, well I don't understand. Right? Is either political or what is no, you you can do both. And and a perfect example is the United States. The United States has political and diplomatic relationships with every single country in South America, Central America, plus Mexico. That's politics. But at the same time, we're conducting all this politics. US corporations are down there mining their resources, polluting their water, uh, causing real problems for the indigenous people and other abuses of power and secrecy. That's not that's 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 something else. Right. So you've got your politics and then you've got other things. Well, the ETs are very much engaging us in a political way, but they have other things that they're doing. And those other things are intriguing and also problematic. Yeah. And one of the points that I like to make, and I'll make it again, and it's just because I like to make some predictions because the ones I get wrong, I just forget about. The ones I get right, I say, hey, look how smart I am. Uh, if I am the extraterrestrial and the, the planet Earth finally confirms our presence so that now it's completely out in the open, there's no barriers anymore, and the whole thing is being intensely engaged by a high-tech civilization, do I continue uninvited individual contact? Do I take anybody out of their bed again? This is a very significant question and point. I think no. I think that the 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 problem for them to continue that once it's now completely understood worldwide that this is going on and the contact experiences are true and there are hundreds of thousands of them so we get a pretty good base knowledge there the odd one out in the fringe you don't have to worry about but the base stuff it's going to be a lot harder to do what they do because there are many measures that could be taken that aren't taken because the government refuses to acknowledge the reality of ETs. And so you just don't have the ability to do it, but there are ways to make it a little harder for ETs to play this. Plus it's not a good look for them. And so they've had plenty of time to achieve what they want to achieve. I think it's possible that it ends with disclosure. Now for some contactees, they'll be really disappointed. Others will be, yeah, I, I, I can do without that. Plus I think in most cases, the ones that are the ones that are maybe not that unhappy with the experience they have, they don't want their kids going through it. And we know that it is genetic. It goes right. from generation to generation. So that is a very distinct possibility. And then if you want to have a little fun yeah. in a post-open contact era, yeah. where we may learn what they can do for us and, 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 and may learn what exactly the nuke situation is going to be, uh, we may have we may learn that there's been a discussion with uh, our world leaders and they posed to them uh, the question, do you think uh, you could set up a situation incentivized where Americans, or, I'm not Americans, but humans who would like to volunteer to be part of this work we're doing, uh, consider that possibility. 
And so they continued to do the work they were doing, but only with volunteers subsidized and paid perhaps by their own government. That sounds like completely crazy science fiction, but in fact, it is common sense. We this is what, exactly the same thing. This is what Zinc is doing. This is what Lightnet's all about, preparing people, involving them in the post-disclosure world with technology and open mind. And talk about that, Zinka, because it's so important. It's a university she's creating. Yeah, so so this is where we teach each other. Um, in so so in other words, we believe that not one person can have the entire story. And so we use a collective intelligence system to call small teams together. There's a guy that's leading that's leading the team, but then everyone is banking their resources and their opinions and their observations into a massive what we call a living library. And this is a knowledge tree. So, so someone may say, you know, the best way that I learned to remote view was doing it this way, or it was reading this book, or this is the research paper. So the, so the, re, so, so the resources go that deep, right? If you want to go down the rabbit hole and you want to search the actual papers about telepathy or whatever it is, then it's there. Um, we can also amass different knowledge about different um different star races. So our reporting contact form is is a massive, you know, work of ontology of how Hernandez was doing it, how Mufon's doing it, like really looking at how this happens. Um, and then we can, then we can, we're doing sentient analysis on everything. And we're also looking like maybe we can build an interface where you can go to a certain star, star system, Syrian, for example, and look at all the contact reports and get to know that. Because if someone thinks they have the full truth and because they were interviewed by a government, there might be other people who also have that, hold that truth, right? And if the the ETs don't want to deal with a military situation, they're going to want to deal with some of us as well. And I think that's the messages we get. So what are those, what are those dealings and how does that work? And sure. I think that, you know, we always want to rise to the surface, the best resources. And that's also the way that the LightNet database system search engine works is that if, if there's a resource that both you, Steve and Alan both like, then it's going to rank higher, you know what I mean, than someone else. And this isn't just like a, oh, sweep the entire internet. Just like you said, Steve, you've curated stuff down to a small, you know, 13,000, but it's not just like any article, right? It's the, the articles that are, sure. right? So I think we want to be organized in this and we want to be um, experiential in this. And I think that it requires new technology, which is why we spent so much money and time building a system where we can have an open data commons on this stuff and also a way to discuss this across different governments, right? Because that's also the name of the game. You know what I mean? We really need to, mm -hmm. to get out of our, our, our silos. Well, you're, you're way ahead on this issue. You're doing things that make sense. Uh, now it's possible to do it and not surprising that people of great quality and intelligence are, are making their moves, but it's only just the beginning. I would like to point out something though. Uh, telepathy and remote viewing are not the same. And, and, uh, it, and when, I, when I stated that telepathy poses extraordinary uh, possibilities and challenges, uh, because it's possible we can do it. Remote viewing is another couple of degrees above that. And what I mean by that is that the technological explanation for brain-to-brain -brain communication, we're kind of getting close to it. Uh, we've even started to develop some success with brain-to-machine interface. But remote viewing is another thing altogether. Remote viewing is happening in a realm that we really don't understand. And it seems to reflect aspects of the universe that we haven't gotten to yet that are truly profound. In other words, you know, if, I could, if I could talk to somebody in the same room without opening my mouth, okay, fine, it's not. But if I could actually go through some process in which uh, I go a great distance and I'm seeing what is going on uh, without being there, that is something that uh, we, we, we know less about. And so 
if that if that if remote viewing gets the full attention it should get and it, obviously it's been slowly evolving and when it first kind of turned up obviously you know the government going i don't know what you're talking about and and and, and the businesses are going i i can't make money from this but if it continues to advance uh it, it is going to really be transformative and i'm not sure in what way but uh boy uh if the and, and of course the ETs could, could confirm this in other words in, in an open contact situation maybe two years from now one of the questions that if I were uh, dealing with them as a as a as a as a, a group or whatever representing the government whatever I would ask them their thoughts on remote viewing and I'm, I'm sure they go a hell of a lot more than we do and what we may learn from them is that there is in fact some sort of morphic field something that we we cannot measure yet but it's actually there. They use it, we can use it. And so they not only can travel star to star, they may even be able to see from star to star because there's this issue of communication, which is still not clear. It's one, you start, traveling from one star to another is one thing. Communicating from one star to another is not quite the same thing. Because you can't, it, it, say you could travel from one star to another in a couple of weeks, but your communication uh, might take, hundreds or thousands of years well that's no good you have to go back and forth back and forth back and forth so again th th but again remote viewing is is a door to something even more profound well, than, Steve, than telepathy or almost anything else i can think of and i'm i'm paying attention i'd like to live long enough to see it defined and i'd like to be able to do it but as it happens i have no gifts whatsoever in these exotic realms i am just absolutely just just it ain't it, it, I got it I don't know why it just isn't there nothing unusual happens to me I don't have any weird things whatever I'm very incredibly your job Steve life. your job is to be grounded that's why Steve <laughs> yeah I'm not I'm not biased at all in terms of uh, paranormal aspects or anything nothing unusual happens to me which oh, is yeah. probably a good thing the idea about remote viewing is that maybe consciousness itself is non-local, that maybe the brain is receiver and that we really exist in the field, the quantum field. That's my theory of how it works. We're actually everywhere all the time, everywhere, every place, all the time, like that uh, Academy Award winning movie. We're actually that. We're just taught to believe we're local when really you could... Uh, you, you can have this a radio anywhere and pick up the same signal because our consciousness is a brain is a hardware for consciousness that is in the field. So essentially, and this might be too far out for you, we are the extraterrestrials. We didn't, humans are great, but the receivership of consciousness makes us non-local and part of the cosmos. I mean, that's a, that's a little extreme uh, part, but I think that might be the case. Well, the, the implications are enormous because if there is this other field, I guess you could say, again, I, we don't have yeah. language yet, but say there's this other field that we don't yet, we can't actually really access in a, in a thorough way, it could explain a lot of things. It could be connected to reincarnation. Reincarnation may be something that is trans, somehow transmitted through this field um, and, and so forth. And there are other aspects. Again, do we need to get to there right now? No, we don't. But uh, we, we, we have enough hints that if the world would just kind of shake its uh, head a little bit, open up and start putting resources into these things, boy, very quickly, we could become very special. Or the ETs might just give us a shortcut. And say here, here's what you got to do, right? A bomb, but I, but a bing. You know why? Why should you have to spend another thousand years figuring this out? We'll just tell you now. Nothing that the thing unusual about that. There's no, you know, this non-interference crap from Star Trek never worked. They never did it, and it's ridiculous. They'll interfere or not interfere as they choose fit. We know they do interfere, and so there's no reason why they might not say, look, you, uh, you, you got, you got these problems. You need to know this, 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 and this, and here they are. Boom, boom. There you go. Now use that. And by the way, uh, in a remote viewing, here's how that works. Okay, uh, just speed it up. It's okay. That's why we go to school. We go to school to learn stuff early so that we can use it. Right. 
right? There's no, no and they're just basically taking us to school. And, and maybe the reason that they would do that is because what I mentioned before, uh, we are a finite planet with only so much space. And we have huge numbers of people, lots of tech. The situation is getting really, really, really complicated and, and, and problematic and dangerous. And so we need that information now, right? You, you, you teach your kids how to be safe early so they'll be safe. You don't let them find out for themselves. And then when they reach the age of 60, say, okay, you've made it this far. Here's some tips. No, you try to, you try to, you try to make them safe early on. We need advice and information so that we can stay safe because we aren't safe anymore. And, uh, and, and they, for whatever reason, have not been willing to simply come on down and say, look, right, uh, here's what you need to know. I don't know the reason they do, but it's probably connected to the nukes somehow. In other words, if we do it, let me, let me, let me just say this. If, if when the Cold War, when, when World War II ends, if the circumstances have been different, and there's a lot of ways you could tweak it to make it different. And you didn't have a situation where some of our top people like Curtis LeMay was saying, we've got to nuke the Soviets immediately. Patton wanted to invade immediately. We, they had to, we had to take them out now because they're going to be this ideological uh, enemy, uh, even though we were allies and they lost and they, they made great sacrifice to defeat the Nazis. And so almost right away, we were creating the basis for the ideological breach that was going to lead to the Cold War and the nuclear weapons. If we hadn't done that, if we had gone a, a different way, uh, it's possible that we would have not gone into a nuclear proliferation mode and we would have not built those weapons and the ETs would have been teaching this stuff in 1960 or 1955. Imagine that, right? Uh, all of these things are, are not unreasonable considerations, but they're in the past. We can't go back and redo it. But I, I hope historians will really focus on this and analyze all of the decision making and everything we did back then that probably should have been done differently, understand what happened then for one reason, so we don't do it again. So when we're in a somewhat similar situation, we don't make these kinds of mistakes that lead to what we have seen in just this last 76 years, which is untold hundreds of trillions of dollars, literally spent on building stuff up and blowing it up, building and blowing, building and blowing it up, plus massive expenditures on military and defense and war, while people starved, people didn't have homes, uh, and people died from diseases. In other words, there's just human suffering, as well as suffering inflicted on the planet because we didn't have the resources to be able to operate on the planet in a productive and, 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 and constructive way. We sacrificed all of that to the God of weapons, the God of war, Ares, right? It's not, it wasn't guaranteed. We could have said, hey, two world wars is enough. Now it's time to like get our act together. We didn't do it. And historians need to find out why so that we don't make another mistake like that. Yeah, that's so true. This is the evolutionary, this is the evolutionary curve. And just as, you know, you, you know, you're mentioning, it's like, are we going to keep re repeating mistakes or not? I just want to comment on a few things that you said. Um, number one is that, um, you know, <laughs> we, we, at LightNet, we don't never allow people to say always or never. So when you say like, oh, I'm never good at those things, like that ends up <laughs> being what happened. Um, and one of the really crazy things that we've realized in our labs is that um, we didn't expect to, quite honestly, we weren't sure that we would get such good results in these teams and we did and it made me think like there's anything special about some people that are better remote viewers than others i mean even i i had my serious doubts i was like well i don't think i can actually do this for, you know what i mean and i could and so it's like so so we always like to say anybody can do this stuff um and 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 some people like alan said are on different missions and your mission clearly has been so important because in addition to putting money into this research and into disclosure we have to put our time and our curiosity 
And one of the most heartbreaking things about where we are right now in the disclosure is people haven't felt comfortable discussing this stuff at the dinner table. People have an experience and then they're like, they don't even want to talk about it because they don't want to be ostracized. So some one dinner of, tables, I mean, th there are yeah, dinner, some tables dinner tables, you know, and it's changing now, like now everyone's talking about it, but that's the fact that everyone's talking about it in part because of your research and because of your life's work is really significant because we are going to be entering into a renaissance as you, you know what I mean, as you know, and the other thing I just wanted to follow up on is that we have had tele telepathy classes and I, I was in one of them. We had one for kids and one for adults. And, you know, Ashley Lee, the, 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 the guide on that, she was like, look, you know, parents don't want to admit it. Um, but almost all children have telepathy and they just don't want to admit that that that's that that's the case and the question is is then how do you deal with it right and we did learn how to turn it off and on you know what i mean to tone it down you know what i mean and turn it up so that's one thing and the same thing has happened with remote viewing so there's some you know it's just talking to someone the other day, they're like, yeah, there's locations where they have to lock it down from remote viewing so that people can't remote view in those places. You know what I mean? So we're just like you're suggesting that we're not going to be able to have this massive disclosure, massive contact until we're grown up to take enough to take the, the weapons off the ships. It's the same thing with these other abilities. You know what I mean? It's like they all have to be dealt with in a mature way or else I'm, you know, I mean, I was at the mystery school and this girl's like, I felt so crazy because I remote viewed my friend's house and I didn't even ask permission for it. You know what I mean? And that all this morality and all these decisions that we have are going to come to the surface, right? I just also want to say Zinka, LightNet needs people's support. They need their activity, need people get involved just tell people how to get involved support your mission and yeah. be part of tell people that yeah 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 so you can go to lightnet.org um you can also reach out to me at zenka at lightnet.org um we we welcome volunteers we welcome donors we welcome data scientists we welcome editors you know there's all sorts of things that get to be done because we actually you know you were saying okay maybe we can ask the ets how to remote view or how to heal ourselves better or how, because obviously they're more advanced but we also feel like in lightnet we're honing in on how to do all those things because we're not just doing classes like willy-nilly we're taking the knowledge of each team, distilling it, and then adding the next team on top of that knowledge and the next team, because all this stuff is changing very quickly. Like all this technology, healing devices, um, understanding, like now in the medical field, we understand that 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 your mental health is, is very important, your physical health. That's bizarre. Like I never knew that. You know what I mean? So all these revelations are starting to surface and we want to ride the evolutionary curve by making those some the sum total of our knowledge available to people so that we can move through this faster to a mature world where you and I, Steve, could be flying to another, you know, mm -hmm. planet, right? Like, let's get there, whether it's through a device where we're teleported or not or whatever, I don't know. But like, that sounds really fun to me. So let's get there faster. I think his research is going to be valuable for the post-disclosure world. Once we get what you've been working so hard for, Steve, and you say, yes, they're here. This is what they're like. Then the training of how to meet these beings on an even playing field without worshiping them as more advanced, because we essentially have the same equipment they do. They may be a little smart, but we have that innate, let's call it soul equipment. Then the light net um, work can then become a kind of um, university type thing for people who are interested in that level of evolution. Does that make sense, Steve? Yeah, one thing you want to consider, though, is, is this, uh, to really pursue these things at the level of degree you want, you need money. And so you need to start thinking about how you prepare to the extent that you can to get ready to raise money post-disclosure. Once disclosure happens, everybody is going to be trying to raise money for a lot of stuff right away, and you don't want to wait. You want to be out there and trying to get funding for your work uh, that, not that you couldn't get it a year or two, I'm just saying, but you, you're going to need money. It's going to be huge competition 
and uh, you, you've, you've established a, a wonderful platform that's worth it, worth supporting. And along those lines, and I think I'll finish with this. Um, uh, I, I'm shortly, I'm, 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 I'm involved in a what hopefully will soon be a a, a media situation here in in Los Angeles connected to the film industry. I hope to be able to announce it. It's nothing massive, but it's it's a, a beginning. Uh, I've spent two years trying to see to what extent we can engage the film industry as all its resources and vast money to really get into this issue in other ways besides just another Marvel uh, tentpole production filled with extraterrestrials, right? Uh, and it's 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 happening. Uh, I wish I was younger because it's a slow process, but whatever. So I've been doing that, and um, I'm now because disclosure is close, going to finally. Uh, and I had reasons why I didn't do this before, uh, convert Paradigm Research Group from a sole proprietorship to a nonprofit, a 501c3, with a board of directors, which will be pretty distinguished. And this thus allows me to go out and raise uh, you know, tax, tax deductible funds. I, I've not done this before. I, I've second guessed myself on it. Should I have done it before? I don't know. Uh, in the it, it, early on, it wouldn't have made much difference. It was very hard to raise money for this, particularly unless you had the connections and I didn't have them. Now I do have connections. So I'm going to to raise money uh, for uh, not uh, tax free money for Paradigm Research Group as a nonprofit think tank. It's going to be a think tank, a boutique think tank. Uh, I hope to to base it in the National Press Building. And its role will have I'll have several uh, roles, uh, several goals. One, obviously, to engage the government to what extent they're going to pay attention and the academic world, whatever, and provide some information and, and, and support, advice, and counseling uh, based upon uh, the, uh, the advisor group that I'll pull together. Not huge. Again, not big think tanks cost tens and tens of millions of dollars. No, no, but a boutique think tank uh, to impact. But that's one of the roles. The other thing, though, the Paradigm Research Group will do as a nonprofit in the post-disclosure world is doing, making the effort in various ways to ensure that all of the people that carry the water on this issue from 47 on, right up until the day of disclosure, are not shoved aside or forgotten or thrown under the bus or whatever, right? Meaning the big guys are in town now. Yeah, it's true. Here we are. Now just go away, you tinfoil hat people. Uh-uh. No, no. I'm going to do what I can to ensure that they are recognized and that they can have as much role possible in the post-disclosure world. Uh, that's one of the things that that we'll, PRG will be doing. Uh, in addition to, as I mentioned earlier, uh, trying to bring into the post-disclosure world in support of of the people in this field, the resources that our massive film industry have developed over the, in the 20th century. It's just unbelievable. And, and to make this point as clear as possible, since 1951, there has been roughly 500 movies, maybe a bit more. It was 410 as of about nine, 10 years ago. So I think it's over 500. 550 movies have been produced for the big screen some television movies, whatever, uh, with extraterrestrials in them, all fiction, right? They have generated way over $100 billion in revenues, right? Maybe as much as $200 billion in revenues for filmmakers, for TV makers, TV show makers, whatever. Massive of money. In all of that time, not a single documentary about UAPs was ever given theatrical distribution. You couldn't go to a theater. There have been political documentaries that have made huge amounts of money, done very well, certainly compared to what they cost. One of the most successful docs of all time was of course, uh, um, blanking it out, don't blank it out, Fahrenheit 911 did $220 million in current money, right? Adjusted for inflation. Political doc, right? These docs can cost, you could do a fantastic doc for eight, nine, 10, 12 million bucks. And it could easily make 
five times that. On the other hand, they'll make a tentpole movie about ETs that cost $220 million, and if the critics don't like it, it'll lose $100 million. And so in all of this time, not a single doc, that can be changed. Now, admittedly, the world is, is different. We're on a streaming, and, and you go in the streaming world, and you are now seeing documentaries turning up on Netflix and Amazon and so forth. Right, they're not getting the resources that could be available to them, but they're they're up there. So we kind of moved into that. But in spite of that, in spite of the fact that you've got successful docs, and I I know people have told me that Amazon has made it clear to them some of the highest rated stuff they got is the damn U UAP docs on 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 their on their platforms. In spite of that, they still cannot get a doc up on the big screen. Why? Because maybe there are those in this town who think, you know, you put a doc on the big screen right now, oh, the, the nice sound and everything, you're giving it gravitas, you're giving it substance. And the government doesn't want it to have gravitas and substance. They would prefer that, it, you know, just make those uh, Marvel movies, make those, uh, you know, Avenger Ultrons and all that kind of stuff, fly around, go around the galaxy. But don't let's don't give the real ET issue gravitas. I'm going to see if I can help change that. And 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 right now we're sort of having some success. I'm not the only one, I assure you. And they will get in eventually. The biggest people in this town are going to get in, and they are going to put money behind educating the world about the real ETs. They will do that, right? They took their time, but once you get to disclosure. Absolutely. They are going to jump in and they are going to help educate the world. That is that learning curve I've talked about that's essential between the time we announce the reality of the ET presence until the time open contact takes place. If I'm the ETs, I would, I would want the planet to have a little bit of time to get up to speed, a little self-education, uh, so that they're pretty knowledgeable and, and, and ready, and therefore open contact would be much less disruptive and almost anticlimactic. And the film industry will do that. But boy, they have not been helping us in this, this effort to end the truth embargo. They have stayed the hell out of it. And a classic example of that, of the problem, which is not just the film industry. This, it's this dynamic between the film industry and the military intelligence state com complex is the movie Independence Day. Independence Day made a ton of money. I mean, it made a fortune and it, it had all the, you know, it was like a, it was like an ad for the, the military and, and so forth with the jets and the this and the that, and they're out there saving the world. And so, yeah, they got a lot of cooperation from the Department of Defense in terms of accessing stuff like airplanes and things you got to have to do that. This happens all the time, except when the DOD found out that Independence Day was going to include Area 51, they pulled all support from that movie immediately. You get me? You see? And so you see how that dynamic is? That's going to change. Look, guys, this has been great. Now I think I am done. Uh, uh, and uh, I hope to learn more about uh, LightNet. I think I hope we uh, get some time together. Obviously, I think it's Contact in the Desert. Alan, I need to get east. I need to get out there and hang with you guys. I just need to get a little more said here, but I do have some very cool news coming up and uh, some of that will come out on, on uh, CITD. And then as soon as I get the nonprofit set up, I want to go talk on every podcast in the world. So I know you'll call me. We will see okay. you at contact. Steve, thanks for years of work. It's finally paying off on the big, not just your work, but everything we've been pushing for. You've been at the forefront. I'm really happy you had a forum here to talk about the past. Still present. here. So are you. Let's hang in. Take care of yourself. Right. Don't. Uh, yeah, do it both ways when you cross the street. OK. Uh, good times are coming and let's, let's celebrate together here in the near future. Huh? Sounds yeah. great. You guys can find more about Steve um, at paradigmresearchgroup.org. You can also follow him on, on Twitter as uh, Steve Bassett. Uh, thanks again. Look forward to seeing you uh, next okay. weekend. All righty. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Thanks. Thanks, everyone, to join us. Uh, great show. I think this was a really important moment that Steve had a chance to just say what he um been been saying all along, but he said it in a really 
well, maybe not concise, but direct way. But it's yeah. been, I think it's been valuable. How do you feel about what the I think it's really great. I mean, I, I would love that he offered the details of the different government, you know, pieces that, you know, the, the, the hearings that have to happen, the post disclosure world, you know, and his thoughts on what we really have to nail, like we have to nail the peace equation, you know, it's interesting. Um, so, so that has to be figured out and I'm excited for his nonprofit, uh, you know, movies do change the world. That is the thing, music and movies, there's nothing, you know, you can write all the articles you want, but that's really the locomotion. So I hope he gets his wishes, uh, and I hope he gets funded well, um, because this, this work is important and, uh, and yeah, he's been, he's been on the front lines for so long. Uh, so, so yeah, we're grateful for his work. I just want to acknowledge Laurie Fry, who's been very um, yes. in the chat and all the people watching online this live program. And let's think about doing on uh, Wednesday the uh, NASA hearings as a watch party. So Zinka, always great to hang out with you and be a part of your excitement, you know, conscious visionary thinking and um yeah, it was amazing to spend the weekend with you, Alan, here in Sedona, running around. And I can't wait to run around with you at Contact in the Desert. You are a walking party uh, and it's going to be great. So, yeah, thanks to everyone who joined us today. Keep up the good work. Uh, and let's let's thank all those congressmen and, and uh, the the journalists who've been, been speaking their mind just like all of you guys. So, yeah, see you next time.